Okay, morning everyone. It is nine o'clock on the dot. Let's see if we can. Welcome to the Standing Committee on Finance, Economic Opportunities and Tourism meeting. Um, I would like to welcome the members, the representatives from Asalamito, officials from the National Department of Trade, Industry and Competition, and officials from the Provincial Department of Economic Development and Tourism who are on the task team assisting with the mitigation of the impact of the possible closure. I have received the following apologies from the Provincial Minister, Minister Mania, from the National Minister, Minister Patel, from the HOD of DDAT, Mr. Furry, and um, Ms. Johnson will be standing in for him today, and from the Director General of the National Department of Trade and Industry, Mr. October. I'll quickly outline our rules of engagement. Members are to remember that our meeting is live streamed on YouTube for everyone to see. All members will be muted at the beginning of the meeting. OK, let me just do that then. OK, but this is to avoid background noises. Um, if you are speaking, then you are welcome to unmute yourself and to switch your video on. And then to please just switch your video and your mic off after you've spoken. Um, if you are presenting, you can obviously also then put your presentation on if you have one. Members are to please flag points of order in the chat function. If we can please just keep that clear of conversation so that we can only deal with technical matters in the chat function. The presenters will be sharing their presentations and all the normal rules of the WCPP apply. Um, and the latest ATCs, which all members have received, indicate the adapted rules as well. So we're going to start just with the introduction first, everyone. I'm going to ask for the members to introduce themselves, and then I will ask for the various officials um, just from the department, just introduce themselves, perhaps the lead presenter from each department and organization can just introduce everyone. OK, members, if I can just have a roll call, please. Lulama Mvimbi. OK, I see Honorable Van der Westhuizen. I hear Honorable Mvimbi. I saw Honorable Mitchell there as well. Um, thank you, Member Chair. Gondlo. Member Nkondlo, welcome. OK. Is member Makamba Bocha online? I don't see her on the on the side here. OK, so those are the members present so today. Um, Asela Mito, are you here today? Are you online? Yes, we are, Chairperson. Thank you. Would you like to introduce your team to us? Mr. Fester? Yeah, sure, Chairperson. Myself, I'm Kubis Fester. I'm the CEO of Arsenal Mittal South Africa. With me here today, I've got Gavin Griffiths. Uh, he's in charge of uh, strategy. On the line as well is Tammy Devisa, Head of Communication and uh, uh, Stakeholder Engagement. And then uh, do we have Aldrich online? Aldrich, yes, Aldrich is there. He's currently in charge of the Saldana wind down operations and the future of Saldana. Thank you. Is DTI on the line? Yes, Chairperson. Uh, am I audible? Yes, you are audible. Uh, good morning. Good morning, honorable members. My name is Tandi Pele. I am the acting deputy director general of the Industrial Competitiveness and Growth uh, Division. I'm responsible for implementation of industrial policy. I'm here with my two colleagues, uh, Mr. Mohamed Vauda who's integrally involved into uh, the, the, the work of the steel industry uh, and also broadly around how to coordinate investments in the country. Um, my other colleague is Ms. Uh, Dr. Umisha Naidu. Uh, she's a manager responsible for primary mineral processing work uh, in, the, in the department. Um, they will reintroduce themselves as we are presenting uh, because we're going to be co-sharing the presentation from the department. Thank you. No problem, thank you so much. Um, DDAT, are you here yet? 
yes, I, I am. Uh, good morning, Honourable uh, Chair and everybody else. Um, let me just put my... Um, so I'm a DDG within the Department of Economic Development and Tourism in the Western Cape, uh, and I'm joined by two of my colleagues. Uh, that's Herman Jonka, who's based out in the West Coast, uh, as well as Bianca in Pashla Schiff, uh, who is responsible for infrastructure um, and innovation. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. And last but not least, actually more important, I just want to ask if there anyone from the public and or media that are online. Going once, going twice. Okay, members, um, I'm just going to give you a little bit of context for the meeting and then we're going to jump right into the respective presentations. So one of the resolutions of this committee was to ask that we receive a briefing on the possible winding down on a cello metal. This resolution, thank you, Honorable Nkondlo, came last year at the end of last year. Asala Mittal also did send us um, extra information at the end of last year before this particular request. And I think members did receive it on the flash drives and so on, which was extra confidential information because it related to the workings of the company specifically. So today the various um, stakeholders on the task team are just going to brief us on what is specifically happening in the winding down operations. And I just want to say thank you so much for being here to the Salem Metal team. Um, you are a private company and we don't have specific oversight role over you, but given the impact in the Saldana Bay area and the roles that the DTI and DDAT is currently playing to assist with jobs, to assist with skills, we really do appreciate it for you to be here today with us. With that, we're going to jump right into presentations. And the Asala Mitchell team, you're welcome to put your presentation up and to start right away. Thank you. Then I'm sure if my new content slide to that. Just hang me. Okay, I content slide to my control. Chair, on a point of, of clarity. Yes, Honorable Mitchell. Thank you very much, Chair. Chair, um, I just want to, um, I see the presentation says strictly confidential, bearing in mind that we are going, we are live streamed on YouTube. Um, I I just want to, to ask that, um, or propose that the, the committee then discuss whether we go into in camera for the for the duration of the presentation, um, or or is is because I mean then the presentation won't be confidential. Um, I don't, Mitchell, I'll answer you on that quickly. Um, I did ask a seller before the presentation if there's any confidential information on the presentation. I'll also ask Mr. Fester just to correct me if I'm wrong. Um, he indicated that the presentation we sent to members that um, that. Um, is fine for public consumption. And um, Mr. Fester, do, um, am I correct here? Um, is there anything that is confidential in the presentation? Uh, Chairperson, you are correct. Uh, we're comfortable that we have narrowed down the set of information disclosed uh, that it's, uh, it's fine for public consumption. Okay. Perfect, thank you. So members, the presentation is okay for public consumption. However, I would advise that if there are any questions or information relating to confidential information, that that is indicated before the information is released. That way, the committee members then at that time can then decide how to move forward. Um, advice that I've received is once uh, members have determined whether or not information is confidential um, if they've decided that after behind camera um, one can then either ask for it to not be disclosed to be disclosed or partially disclosed and given that we are uh, YouTube and live streaming 
my suggestion would be that certain confidential information then also be perhaps then put in writing to members. But if there is any confidential of such a nature, I think we can deal with it at that stage. If that is okay with Mr. Fastad? 100%, thank you, Chair. No problem. You can go ahead with the presentation. All right, uh, Chairperson, thank you. And uh, thanks for the, uh, for the listening to us. Uh, I think this is a complex uh, situation, and uh, I think uh, our willingness uh, to engage on this, um, obviously we're sensitive around the impact that Soldana have on the region specifically, but Ashlo Mittal broader on the economy and the country. So if we look at the content slide, I would just like briefly to, ch to touch on uh, Ashlo Mittal South Africa. Uh, a quick conversation on the next slide around the. Uh, um, can you carry on to slide five, please? Three. Uh, around the steel industry in South Africa, I then want to spend time specifically on Saldana, where we where we uh, decisions would be taken, where we are currently, and then potentially discuss how we see uh, unlocking. Uh, value employment uh, into the future. And I will then conclude on uh, our commitment as a South African company uh, to the economy. So if we go to the introduction of Ashlo Metal on slide five, I mean, we are the largest uh, steel producer uh, uh, in Africa. Um, we used to produce around 6 million tons. We currently anticipated to produce around 3 million ton, tons per annum uh, as a result of various factors, which we will come to later. We're part of the Arslo Metal Global Group. They are the largest steel producer uh, in the world, and obviously that gives us access to technology and other benefits uh, that we would otherwise not be uh, privy to. Um, we produce largely uh, flat and long products uh, in our currently at our Funabel Park plant, Newcastle, in Pretoria, and we used to produce uh, 1 million tons roughly per year uh, in Saldana steel. You can see, we will not discuss it, but on the annex slide, slide, uh, slide 18 specifically, there we give a, uh, a, a, a bit more detail on who we are in terms of the products that we produce, uh, the industries that we serve, um, and there you will get an indication that uh, although there's other steel producing companies in South Africa, the, 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 the variety of products produced by AMSA is not only unique in South Africa, but it's also quite unique uh, in the world. Then we also produce uh, commercial coke, which we supply to the federal alloy industry, which is an export-led uh, industry. Um, and uh, we also, to the extent that we increase capacity there, is a direct replacement of uh, imported coking coal, mainly from China. We supply approximately 75% of the steel use in South Africa, but we also export uh, Sub-Sahara Africa and we service the neighboring countries, as we call Africa Overland. At current, uh, at reduced levels, we employed uh, over 8,000 own people. And then we have on a permanent basis over 2,000 uh, subcontractors and service providers. But from an indirect perspective, uh, the steel industry, we provide downstream job creation of around 120,000 uh, indirect jobs uh, in the total supply chain. I think it's a uh, common cause that we are the, the backbone of the steel base uh, industrial manufacturing that in total contribute around 600 billion or 15% of the G GDP uh, into South Africa. <clears throat> uh, as uh, Ashromital South Africa, we contribute around 15 billion directly or indirectly to the fiscus and to state-owned enterprises, uh, mainly Transnet, ESCOM, and the port authorities. Uh, Chairperson, we have, uh, for, for the benefit of, of the members, uh, attached a few annexures. 
which we will not discuss, but it's just our footprint and our uh, value chain, uh, our sort of sales environment, uh, what is our value creation model, and also then, as previously stated, the detail on our product range, the industries that we service, and our regional capacity. If we go forward two slides, uh, the steel industry in South Africa. Uh, SA steel industry has been in a constant decline for a number of years. Uh, currently, we estimated that we are below levels of 10, 12 years ago from a domestic consumption perspective. The deindustrialization, a loss of local manufacturing capacity, uh, continued low economic growth in South Africa, as well as a, a global oversupply, overcapacity of steel. And in the last two years, major geopolitical shifts, specifically referring there to trade wars outside our borders, had a significant impact on the steel industry uh, globally, but also uh, more profoundly uh, in South Africa. Um, as a company, we have lost significant cash over the past uh, 10 years uh, and uh, had to rely on support from our parent company uh, to continued operations. <clears throat> I think it's important uh, to stress that uh, we are appreciative of government's uh, support in terms of protection measures, despite South Africa's uh, steel industry being underprotected relative to other countries in the world especially the downstream industry where the, the, the protection is relative low. Um, our survival and sustainability depend on achieving certain cost initiatives. So um, in the company, we talk about the controllable cost side of the business. So what can we, what can we do? In terms of that, we had a very uh, structured transformation program where we have realized uh, over 2 billion savings in the late 18 and 2019 by addressing specifically productivity, efficiencies, uh, maintenance, cost, reliability, uh, to an extent raw material, energy, and uh, logistical costs uh, outside the regulated uh, environment. Um, to secure a, a competitive and a fair priced regulation is important for us uh, to make sure that there's a, a fair dispensation uh, from a competitive uh, perspective. Um, so basically from a capacity perspective, um, uh, the last two years and especially currently, and I'm, I'm not talking about COVID specific, outside the COVID impact, we have been reducing capacity and idling facilities, uh, largely as a result of uh, weak domestic demand. So on the right-hand side, you will see a process more broadly that we have followed is uh, uh, in, in, in 2019, we have embarked on a large-scale uh, productivity and labor reorganization process. Uh, we have done a substantive uh, study around the long-term sustainability of various of our operations, which we refer to as a footprint review. Uh, as a first conclusion of that was basically the, the decision to close Sultana. <clears throat> a second review was more on the long steel products, where <clears throat> we have announced that we will continue uh, to operate the Newcastle long steel product site, despite it having substantial structural cost disadvantages. <clears throat> if we go to uh, Saldana specific, uh, I mean, if, so if we look at uh, Saldana was sort of built and designed as a facility uh, to beneficiate uh, basically iron ore to utilize a low cost base uh, from electricity, labor, and other input materials uh, to a dedicated export market. Um, <clears throat> the Saldana Works competitiveness and uh, future sustainability has been severely impacted by the, the loss 
of these uh, initial competitive advantages, uh, most notably the low iron ore uh, supply contract, but also a continued above inflation uh, increases uh, of electricity, port costs, rail costs, as well as other input materials. I also think that South Africa is unique in the sense that our labor cost on average, and not only pertaining to Saldana, has continued to increase uh, uh, every year. Um, so our uh, negotiations uh, for better uh, structural cost has been unsuccessful, uh, and Saldana still has, has uh, uh, basically the decision has been taken without addressing those structural changes to basically put the plant in, in care and, and, and maintenance. I mean, <clears throat> these cost uh, uh, issues that I'm, I'm referring to, all of them are very complex issues um, and difficult to resolve. Um, so the future of Saldana basically uh, is, is uh, decline as a result of those few cost factors being electricity port, regulated cost, uh, the loss of a beneficial iron ore pricing, uh, as well as the reduced access to developmental domestic pricing. If we go to slide 11, and uh, prior to care and maintenance, so I want to discuss in this slide sort of what has happened prior to, to the closure of Saldana, where we are currently, and how do we see uh, the potential future of Saldana. So uh, we had many constructive engagements with government, organized labor, various of the uh, state-owned enterprises. Uh, we have put on hold uh, for a period the large-scale uh, labor, labor reorganization in the total uh, Arshlomital South Africa uh, to try and get some form of, of, of solution. And uh, I think, as I said previously, these are complex uh, uh, issues, um, and we were unable to get uh, a required adjustment in the cost base uh, to ensure a sustainable uh, Saldana steel. We therefore had to take the difficult decision to, to go into a process of a, an ordinary or, and commercial wind down uh, of Saldana. Uh, that process will be largely completed by the end of, of uh, uh, the month, to be honest. Um, if it wasn't for the COVID period, uh, we would have, uh, the process started with reducing uh, all input materials, and then start closing the facility from the primary steel producing process, uh, work through all working process to finish stock. And at that point in time, we had to shut down due to the COVID. So uh, in the unlocking of 50% of operations, we are now in the process of uh, rolling the last uh, sort of uh, parts of uh, flat products in that area. Um, so factually, S Saldana is almost completely closed at this point in time. Most of the people and subcontractors has been uh, released uh, and we are basically in care and maintenance, having a small crew available uh, to ensure that the asset remains uh, in a decent uh, condition. So how do we see the future of, of Silvana? Uh, to be honest, with substantial structural uh, and sustainable benefits uh, for uh, Saldana from the cost elements I've uh, alluded to earlier, a restart in the short term is, uh, or medium term, is highly unlikely. Um, there's been many uh, uh, articles in the media that, that uh, there's a host of people interested uh, in acquiring Saldana. Um, we have received uh, numerous approaches, but to be honest, to date, 
uh, none of them is actually uh, really viable. Um, there's no uh, real uh, contender that we believe can take Sildana on a current scenario and make it profitable. Um, Chairperson, important to understand at this point is that the Sildana operations is a quite modern plant, run very efficiently. So the, the opportunities to improve cost through operations are very limited uh, because it's, it operates at, uh, from an efficiency perspective uh, at really benchmark levels or had operate at that point in time. When we start to look at alternatives, how do we, how do we use the asset for, for future use? Um, we've realized that location-wise, infrastructure-wise, the future of the, mostly the adjacent land uh, and those things has quite a good opportunity to convert uh, the place to a, a logistical hub, some form of inland port, um, as well as we have a lot of land for sustainable and renewable energy, which a lot of people have showed interest. So on those two elements, uh, we are actually issued inquiries into the market, and we have received uh, positive uh, interest, uh, especially on the logistical hub in the inland port. And we believe if we channel our focus to that area, it can actually be a new development that uh, most likely can employ an equal amount of people that we were forced to release uh, previously. So uh, on conclusion of that, that slide, I just want to re-emphasize to, to the members and to yourself, Chairperson, that uh, getting to a decision uh, to stop operations and close a substantial part of our business uh, was a very difficult process. But if we look back at the steel environment internationally uh, and currently, uh, prior to COVID, uh, in South Africa, the decision was definitely the right decision. And if we had not taken it, the financial stress on the company uh, that Saldana Steel would have uh, brought would have been unbearable to us. In conclusion, uh, on slide 30, I mean, I just want to emphasize that uh, Arslo Middle South Africa, we remain highly committed to South Africa and to the, to the region and to play our part uh, in, in manufacturing and uh, growing some of the lost capacity and capabilities that the industry uh, have uh, encountered. And I mean, we've demonstrated that uh, through the continuous uh, investment in capital equipment, despite making losses for a number of years, um, we have benchmarked our capex spent versus other people in the other companies in the world. And normally when people make a negative cash flow and a negative profit, they will not invest in capital. We have continued to do that. We have, with the, uh, the, the DTIC, um, spent a lot of time in revitalizing the high, high felt structural steel mill. Um, we've also restarted the electric arc furnace uh, in Vereniging about two years ago. Um, in addition, we've acquired uh, the Tabazimbi mine, and initially it was purely for a uh, environmental rehabilitation program. We have actually started to process some, some material there, and we are in a feasibility study to see how we can longer term unlock economic growth in an area that's also been uh, affected uh, by the closure of, of a mine. We are looking to unbundle part of our coke business <coughs> for co-investment, uh, to potentially grow that part of the business with a partner, which have the appropriate uh, capital available, uh, and that will be largely to replace current significant imports from either China, Russia, or Turkey. Um, 
We also work with the department uh, on the steel master plan to see how UNSAC can play a role uh, in re-energizing and revitalizing the downstream uh, steel manufacturing industry uh, and start growing uh, or participate in growth of the economy in the longer term. Uh, chairperson, that is uh, roughly uh, how we have come to the conclusion and uh, the current status of Saldara and that we do believe, although not in steelmaking, that there are actually opportunities to replace the amount of uh, uh, jobs that was lost and to start making a contribution uh, again to the area. Uh, thank you, Chair. I will uh, hand back to you and uh, I don't know the proceedings further. Thank you, Mr. Fester, for the presentation. I can only imagine that these decisions are never easy. Members, before I open for questions and answers, I would like to ask if we can finish the presentations and briefings from DTI and DDAT as well before we do questions and answers, if that is okay with everyone, just so that we can make sure that we beat the clock today. Everyone happy with that? Going once, going twice. Okay. Supported, okay. supported, Chair. Okay, perfect. DTI, are you ready for your presentation? Uh, yes, Honorable Chair, can you just give me a minute to load it? Um, no problem. While you are loading, I just want to say thank you so much for being here today. Um, I do believe that the Finance, Economic Opportunities and Tourism Committee of the Western Cape has um, been quite progressive in the past year in trying to engage various different stakeholders um, across national, provincial, local, and even in the private sector. So I really appreciate the fact that you are here today to assist us in this briefing. Thanks, thanks. Thank you, Jay. Um, am I audible? Is the presentation on the screen? I'm unable to see the presentation at the moment. Okay, um, technology problems. No problem. We live and we learn through the technology <laughs> age. But I did press the share button. Is it there now? Let's see quickly. Oh, Lizette, are you putting it on? No, no, I'm putting it on here. Oh. <laughs> Okay, I'm not sure whether uh, I can I can okay. share it. Um, uh, Ms. Pele, is it okay if Ms. Kluta puts it on? She was able to share it for you. Um, let's try again. She probably I had forgotten to switch on my camera. Probably that's the reason why it was not showing. So I no, think no. it should work now. Um, is it there now? Give it a second or so quickly. I don't see anything yet. Okay, um, probably the secretariat can assist um, and then we will then indicate when we need the presentation to be moved. Uh, Thank problem? you, Mr. Deza. Ms. Uh, you can just, okay. Yeah, Mr. Deza can, Mr. Deza can just go um, when I can move to the next slide. Okay. No problem. Uh, Okay, Lizette, can you put it then on for us quickly, please? And just put it in presentation mode, maybe. Members, um, just a reminder that if the information on the presentation is too small to read, um, it is also in your files document under this committee's um, documentation if you want to follow it there as well. But thank you, Ms. Peeler. You're welcome to continue. Uh, thanks, Chair. Um, our presentation is a bit similar or would underscore some of the points that uh, the CEO of Asolo Metal has already advanced. Uh, we're going to cover three parts to the presentation. The first part is just to give a sense of the policy context. Why have we been so worried and engaged with Asolo Metal into this process? 
uh, give our perspective on what are the challenges facing the steel industry, both globally and domestically, give a highlight of some of the performance and, and opportunities uh, that are arising out of the steel value chain. Uh, those two points will be covered by Dr. Umisha Naidu. I will come back in to give uh, the, the, the honorable members a sense of the key interventions we have already provided to the sector and some of the ongoing um, 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 interventions that we are continue to implement. Um, uh, Mohamed Wata will come in to give uh, the committee a sense of the support we have already given to Asolomital. And in our engagement or the team's engagement with the provincial structure, they had indicated the desire to work around um, an opportunity to, to resuscitate probably the Saldana area you know, to an industrial complex, some of the work that we've already done with Asolo Metal on the high felt uh, steel, so that we can learn from uh, each other and see how the models that we have implemented to resuscitate high felt uh, industrial complex has assisted. And I'll come in back uh, with one slide on the conclusions around where's our process going in terms of resuscitating this, this important value chain and the ongoing process that we have uh, led by the Minister on developing a master plan uh, for the sector. Just a couple of few points, and I think uh, Kubas has already made this point, that beneficiation is a very important and a key thrust of our industrial policy. And it's important that we strengthen uh, uh, value addition in the domestic economy by developing manufacturing ca capabilities uh, particularly in this uh, steel uh, supply chain. Uh, the steel supply chain for us is uh, very critical due to the enormous backward and forward linkages this value chain presents. And it is actually for us at the, at the central uh, point of any industrialization path. And it's important in us driving competitiveness um, across the entire manufacturing sector. So um, the, both the carbon and the steel, uh, the, the carbon and the stainless steel uh, fabrication sector um, is fundamental to the South African manufacturing uh, sector. And its products are actually very applicable and very much in use across the entirety of the economy. Um, as the members are aware, um, in the sixth administration, we launched what we call the Reimagine Industrial Strategy, with pri which, which prioritizes key national priority sectors and one of them is this important uh, uh, value chain. So I will hand over to Umisha. Umisha, uh, okay, the Secretariat can move to the next slide. Uh, she will run through a couple of slides, um, uh, just giving a sense of, of, of the performance and the, the, the challenges that are being faced by the, uh, by the sector. And as I've already indicated, many of these points uh, the Asolomital uh, colleagues have already made, so we'll run very quickly uh, on, on those points. Um, thank you, Tandi. Um, good morning, um, honorable members, colleagues and industry. Um, I will take you through some of the key um, 2019 global and domestic performance data um, to provide context and perspective um, on some of the challenges um, that the industry is facing, as well as some of the opportunities. Um, the first slide um, reflects the importance of the steel value chain to manufacturing in the economy, um, where major steel consuming sectors, including construction, automotives, mining, account for 15% of uh, GDP, formally employing 1.5 million people and another 2.1 million people informally. We can move on to the next slide. Thanks. Um, the biggest challenge, um, as was indicated in the previous presentation, affecting the steel industry today is um, excess global capacity, currently at over 400 million tonnes. Um, it continues to be uh, one of the biggest challenges, considering slow global economic growth, price volatility, margin pressure and rising debt, creating very difficult operating conditions for steel makers. Um, small developing economies um, like ours are disproportionately affected, resulting in uh, import penetration and limited export markets as countries deploy protection. And um, this has impacted Saldana, as you know, it is um, an export focused plant and um, the limited export markets and the pressure in those markets has impacted it. 
Um, and this applies across the value chain, both primary and um, downstream products. Um, we've also seen with the COVID-19 pandemic, um, there's been accelerated effects of low demand, overcapacity, weak balance sheets, and liquidity challenges impacting the viability of an industry that was already in distress. Thank you. Next slide. Um, I'll just go through these slides quite quickly. Um, there it uh, depicts various graphs of some of the challenges and um, also the opportunities in the steel value chain. Um, in 2019, we did see a decline in employment in basic iron and steel, as well as in some of the downstream metal and fabricated sectors. Key consuming sectors like construction and mining also recorded job losses. Um, over 50% of steel goes into construction, um, another 10% into autos, and 10% into machinery and equipment. So the performance of these sectors are very integral um, in terms of the steel value chain. Um, we also saw steel demand contracting for a second year in a row. Um, the forecast for 2020, given the pandemic, is um, expected to be even lower at 3.3 million tons per annum. Thanks, we can move on. In terms of um, imports of primary steel, um, as you would see in the graph um, labeled number five, Imports um, did come down in 2016, 2017 with the introduction of duties and trade remedy measures. However, we do see that um, imports still account for 20% of domestic consumption of primary steel. Um, there's also a further 1.7 million tons of manufactured imports um, ranging from wires, fasteners, tube and pipe structures that are uh, coming in. Um, and these definitely present opportunities um, for our local manufacturers and mills to um, replace imports and produce the products um, locally. In summary, um, on the next slide, um, just to go through some of the challenges, um, as I've indicated, reduced infrastructure spending and um, a decline in the construction sector has decreased demand for steel. Global overcapacity and overproduction um, has resulted in low prices of primary steel as well as value added products. Uh, reduced domestic and global competitiveness is worsened by in steep increases in production costs in terms of raw materials, electricity, and logistics. Um, we've also seen limited investment in plant technology and skills. Um, we have increased deployed of trade remedy as well as duties, both domestically and globally, has led to declining export markets. Um, capacity underutilization has led to plant closures and job losses. And then, um, as I've indicated, the COVID-19 impact. Um, where currently industry is focusing on restoring liquidity orders and supply chains. Um, there are um, opportunities in the sectors that I have um, highlighted in terms of mining, automotives and construction um, that we are focusing on in terms of the master plan. And um, Tandy will give you more information on that in the next few slides. Thank you. Th th thanks, Umisha. Um, let me just continue where Umisha has left off. Uh, the next three slides, we're just going to run through some of the interventions we've already provided uh, as a collective government and also working together with partnership with our DFIs and, and, and industry on the measures uh, we have implemented to, uh, uh, to, to assist the industry. The first one talks to the trade support. Um, through the, the, the difficulties that the, collect, the entire value chain has faced uh, with competing against cheap imports, 
uh, we have uh, went in to increase the general duties um, on primary steel and also uh, introduce some um, uh, remedies um, uh, in terms of safeguard on hot roll coil and plate uh, products. And some of uh, the hot roll coil is products that are actually produced at Saldana uh, Mill. Uh, we have increased uh, duties on a range of downstream products to the maximum bound rate allowed. We have also introduced trade remedies. Uh, we have deployed uh, uh, rebates in primary products where the local steel mills are unable to produce to the, the level or quantities required by the domestic uh, do, um, downstream industry. Uh, we have also been working with SARS around what we call a price reference uh, 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 system. Uh, where we are continuously providing some surveillance on uh, addressing the issue about uh, low low priced imports uh, and also tackling the issues of illegal trade, uh, issues of misdeclaration and the invoicing, uh, which have really infiltrated the local industry and have uh, really uh, taken away some of the competitive uh, uh, advantages that the, the value chain has had in the past. Number two, Utilizing the public procurement as a lever, uh, we have uh, uh, designated the steel intensive sectors under the triple PFA. Uh, in the past, in the first round of the designation, we had uh, deemed primary steel uh, as locally produced, even when uh, the value adding uh, uh, industries were importing the steel. Uh, but due to the issues that Umisha has already indicated around uh, global overcapacity, um, low priced imports, we have taken a decision to remove the, 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 the deeming of steel in order to ensure that the public procurement lever also support uh, the primary steel uh, mills locally. Next slide. Um, the next one, in 2017, uh, we have introduced what we call the Steel Competitiveness Fund, working together with the IDC. Uh, it's a concessionary uh, industrial financing tool. Uh, to assist the industry to uh, upgrade with working capital requirements and also uh, to support key investments in key uh, downstream um, sectors uh, and also to deal with some of the distressed position that the industry finds itself in. Um, we have also worked with ArcelorMittal uh, on uh, trying to find measures to support them uh, as our core and the main producer of steel. And the, the only or, or the, uh, the the main producer of uh, of flat steel uh, products. Unfortunately, some of these interventions uh, have not really been enough to prevent the closure of Sardana. Um, Mohammed will take us through further details on some of the work that we had done with Asolomital on that. As per my introduction, uh, we have also included two slides or so on the work that we have done with a uh, high felt um, uh, industrial complex to give uh, the members a sense of the kind of things that we can really think about going forward on how we can resuscitate probably the Sardana into a new industrial park uh, going forward. The next slide. Um, um, what we have also been implementing is a, what we call a, a, a price preference system that is administered by ITEC. Uh, which uh, the intention of this uh, measure is to ensure availability of good scrap uh, for further processing domestically uh, to support the steel uh, mini mills and also the foundry industry. Um, the intention of this is that going forward, we are intending to replace those uh, issues because of some of the shortcomings in the implementation uh, with some measure around uh, export taxes. Uh, that are going to be uh, administered together with the Ministry of Finance. The last point on our side is that with those measures introduced, obviously there's been issues uh, in the domestic economy around the issues about pricing, particularly in relation to flat steel products. As we are implementing these measures, we have also been in discussion with ArcelorMittal. We had agreed on a set of uh, pricing principles around the, steel, uh, the flat steel uh, products to ensure that um, products or the flat steel products are appropriately priced uh, to support uh, further uh, downstream um, activities uh, locally. So I'll hand over to Mohammed just to take us through the, 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 the four slides or so uh, on, on the support to Asolomital and, and, and Highfield uh, Industrial Complex. Uh, thank you, Tandi. Um, so just this background, um, in, in June 2019, EMSA announced that it was going to retrench 2,000 employees. And then 
Subse subsequently, they advised that they were going to close down Sildana and possibly Newcastle. However, as uh, Koba stated, that uh, Newcastle is still under discussion, but, they, but they're keeping it open. So Sildana plant produces a unique product range that is thin gauge, consumed mostly by the export market, with more than 70% supplied to the African continent. The mill is unable to compete with with, with with the Chinese and so on, and therefore, like it's 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 face declining orders. Um, so um, when when these things we announced, government initiate meetings between AMSA and AMSA Solidarity to explore plans to save uh, save jobs, including a short sub uh, suspension of the retrenchment process, and that was acceded to while the negotiations were going on. So uh, AMSA approximately needed about 4 billion rand savings annually. And government could like arguably come up with about 500 million rand a year. And that's including concession from ESCOM, Transnet, and well, uh, AMSA will argue whether the concession from Kumba was actually real. Uh, there were labor productivity commitments from NUMSA and Solidarity, but uh, AMSA found that it wasn't sufficient. So the plant now is, as as Kobus stated, under under can maintenance or very close to that. Uh, next slide. Next slide, please. Sorry, could we have the next slide? Is it? If we can. Okay, there we go. Thank you. So uh, to date, we, you know, we're still urging AMSA to engage with interested parties in looking at acquiring. No, no, sorry. Uh, go back. Go back, Lizelle. Lizelle. Lizette, if you can go one slide back, please, quickly. Lizette, can you? Uh, uh, there we go. OK, so well, uh, well I mean, uh, uh, and we did introduce AMSA to a few potential buyers. Uh, there was B player, and I think that's going significantly well but it doesn't solve the problem of Saldana. Um, there, there has been downstream player that's looking, uh, that we, was engaging with AMSA and I mean, from, from both parties, uh, those discussions started, but uh, there, were, there were no conclusions to those discussions. And then there were other people that expressed interest. So there wasn't anything substantial. And here I just want to pause a bit in that um, while, while, um, while there wasn't partners and there were some, some sort of partners that we've recommended the two AMSA, one, one being the downstream player, if, if that particular player bought into AMSA and if that became a reality, then that would have been a direct comp competition to Arsenal and Metal internationally. And so what, what I'm thinking about is that perhaps AMSA could look at partnering with, with this particular downstream player and also another player, which I'll introduce the AMSA to later, that might be able to bring in iron ore at a concessionary price. And, and maybe that might work. And I'll take discussion on with AMSA with that as we go forward, because I've been speaking to the other uh, players and they said that might be a possibility or they might consider such a possibility, and that's something we can we can take through. And given that iron ore is a very substantial input cost, this might be something that might just help in in pointing this this business into the right direction. Again, we are very concerned, you know, with the downstream player, in that uh, they have a supply agreement with AMSA, and this 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 downstream player is based in Cape Town, and that if this agreement uh, is not going to go further, we have to consider ways in actually allowing them to import the inputs that they require. So um, the DTI would continue to engage, you know, and put every effort in place to try and save Soldana. Uh, the next slide, please. The next slide. Okay, so uh, coming to Highfelt, um, Highfelt uh, was established in 19... 66 and they produce, uh, I, mean, I mean, they manufacture of structured steel products and so on. And in, in 2007, Everest acquired HIFA steel, but later experienced sustained financial losses due to both operational and market factors 
resulting in Haifel being put into business rescue. This resulted in 2,000 workers losing their jobs completely. Uh, on a particular day, everyone had to just leave. And then through the help of AMSA, we, uh, we, we were able to get blooms from the Newcastle plant, which enabled us to restart the structural steel mill at Haifel. And that brought back about, uh, about 250 jobs, it was funded by the IDC, and that really created the basis of an anchor client. And with that, Haifel was able to sublease most of its other businesses or, or its other premises. And today, you know, we have 52 tenants, which 34 black industrialists employing 1,597 people. And this is against the loss of, of 2,000 jobs uh, initially when Haifel closed down. Uh, next slide, please. Next slide. Okay, so AMSA has now bought that structural steel mill at Haifal, and there's a very good opportunity to produce uh, railway lines at that particular plant. We've never produced this before, but because of the quality of the blooms that comes from AMSA Newcastle, we are able to do that. And that would, uh, that would uh, once it is uh, operational, would result in very significant import replacement. So the railways, uh, again, other things, you know, you, you know, to look at Haifel, the railway siding, they're the second largest in the country. And then this allowed junior miners to store coals there and take it to the Richards Bay uh, coal terminals. And so that, that supported a whole lot of junior miners who were able to move like 3.2 million tons of coal uh, uh, from, from that site to uh, four exports, which, we, which they weren't able to do before. Uh, the DTI is working with uh, Haifel to restart the iron processing plant. To this end, Haifel has reached agreement with Sale, that's a mining company, to, uh, to, uh, to, to process ferrochrome at, uh, at, at the Haifel premises. There's also the Mapox mine, which is, which is also going to now supply um, a vanadium ore to start one of the, uh, I mean, the second iron plant in that area. Uh, I mean, in the in the in the complex. So what we have here is that uh, Highfelt has come back to business, and its its various parts are actually working as a whole again. But given that it's divided, and with the strength of L M S and bringing good quality steel into the process, it's actually more than what it was before. I mean, we, uh, we've done a lots of things to bring that business back. In fact, you, you know, with the availability of water and land, there we actually started even growing mealies in that premises and selling, you know, you know. So like, it's, it's, it's been quite a happy story and we think we can do much more around that high, high felt industrial park. On the AMSA side, I mean, if you look at what, what is proposed, it seems like it's not going to be a steel plant anymore. And the question is whether it can be brought back to a steel plant. If someday you need to start producing steel again, you know, post COVID, we might have a situation, you know, you know the, the world is changing and people might re rely less, to, less on China and whether we can protect this asset going forward. And that's, that's the question we need to keep in mind as we look at transforming the Saldana steel plant. Uh, that's all from me. Okay, I Thanks, think- Thanks, Mohammed. Okay. Thanks, Mohammed. I think as a way of concluding, this is our last slide. As the committee members would realize that we have done a lot of work, a lot of engagements with ArcelorMittal in developing the interventions and also working together with the entire value chain to ensure that we are able to be as responsive as possible to, to, to the opportunities and the challenges that the value chain uh, experiences. Um, AMSA is a key uh, uh, steel manufacturer. We will continue to partner with the company, uh, as we have already indicated, and they have also indicated, the CEO indicated this point, that we are in the, in the process of developing a steel and metal fabrication master plan, uh, which aims to support uh, the medium to long-term growth, development, and sustainability of this important value chain. The intention of this master plan is that it should be very action-orientated based on identifying uh, competitiveness improvements in firms. We need to do a lot around uh, improving the demand uh, um, uh, side measures. 
uh, we need to also do a lot of work around how we're going to work together as uh, as social partners to reduce imports and reposition the industry to be resilient under those intense global pressures. And the global pressures are not going to get any better or any easier. We need to find a way of ensuring that we are able to be resilient and competitive um, against our key competitors. Uh, the key uh, part of the master plan is that it has to be based on, it's going to be very ba ba based on reciprocal commitments from the social partners, which will be implemented in stages. We're not going to be waiting to have a perfect document, a perfect plan, as we are getting a sense of what are the key programs that we can be implementing as a collective, we'll implement and continue to refine um, our policy and our strategy going forward. Uh, this process is intended to be completed uh, within this financial year and is very much driven uh, by uh, the minister and the, the ministry itself. Um, thank you, Chairperson, uh, for the opportunity. We will end here. Thank you so much, Ms. Pele, and your team for the presentation. We really appreciate it. We're going to go directly into um, the briefing from DDAT. Uh, Ms. Johnson, I don't think I received a presentation, so if you have one, if we can just put it up, or will you be speaking us through the briefing? Uh, Chair, I, hi. Um, I, we, I think we did send one, but I think uh, Herman uh, Jonker will be doing the presentation on our part, and that's really orientated to our response to uh, the announcements and the discussions we've had with AMSA that they were looking to wind down the plant. Herman, if you could please take over. Thank you. Thank you, Joe, um, and good day, Chairperson, Honourable Members, um, our guests from AMSA and, uh, and of course my colleagues from the DTI. Chairperson, if you allow me to just say a quick special hello to Ms. Pele. We've uh, did an academic program together in 2008, and we haven't been seeing each other. So to me, it was a little small mini reunion. Um, but with <laughs> Mohammed and Umisha, I've been working more more consistently lately. Um, Chairperson, thank you. I'm going to run through the presentation fairly quickly. Um, is the screen visible to everybody? I can see the presentation. Members, are you able to see the screen? Okay, I'm going to assume it's a yes if no one answers. Mr. Yes, Jonker, make... sorry. Okay, thank you. Mr. Jonker, you can continue. Thank you, Chair. Um, we've been working closely with the D DTI and uh, EMSA for a while, so I'll go through this fairly quickly. Uh, the background there just um, I'm indicated some 2016 engagements through what we called the West Coast Industrial Plan, but there were some, some very in-depth in, in, uh, engagements with the local Saldana team and uh, AMSA National since 2012 um, and onwards. Uh, more recently, obviously, we had some direct dealings with the Chief Operating Officer and the local GM in Saldana, Mr. Juan Pedro Jimenez Navarro, um, and his team to look at you know, what, what is possible in trying to still keep Saldana um, open. Um, but once the review of assets was announced in November, um, we understood that the writing was on the wall and um, our ministry and the municipality and the departmental team, as well as uh, some of our entities and the DTI, uh, quickly gathered this task team and it was a very sort of pragmatic approach. It wasn't really changing any of the structural stuff um, or responding to the industry as a whole, but, but really trying to focus on Soldana itself. Um, and we established that task team, which met uh, every week since the end of last year, right through early this year. And, and maybe I can also just remind everybody that this was a pre-COVID world, pretty much. We are now so much in a COVID world that some of these things, when I look back at them now, they, they sound a bit funny because, you know, we're in, we're in, a, we're in a great crisis um, nationally and internationally around the economy. We saw this as a first economic shock, big economic shock to the Saldana region. So, so Saldana has kind of had a rough economic ri ride, first the drought, then some uh, energy issues, then um, Saldana still closing down, and, and now, of course, the current situation with COVID-19. But, but at the time, we, we, we uh, instituted these six work streams, and I'll go through them, um, I'll go through them very quickly. The first one was direct support to workers at the steel plant that were affected. Um, and I'm not going to read through the whole background of this work stream there, but perhaps show 
the next slide um, with our colleagues from Department of Local Government and Department of Social Development, there was an enormous effort uh, to put together these open days, which was around career resilience and community resilience. It was an outreach program hosted at the Multipurpose Center in Saldana. We had 23 partner organizations offering support to, uh, to individuals and had these information stations and help desks where 1,200 people attended uh, over those two days. Uh, we did some strong messaging into the community, but also to the workers at AMSA, and, uh, and 177 of the workers attended those two days. We were planning a second round of open days uh, in the 7th and 8th of May, but of course that uh, fell, fell away because of the lockdown. And there's some ongoing social support in the area, our Department of Social Development doing food parcel and other support. And, and remember again, this was, this was pre-COVID, so um, obviously now there's all kinds of other social support that has kicked in and a much larger effort, but, it, uh, but, but these were some of our early efforts. Um, there's some pictures of what it looked like in the two days uh, with people stopping at these workstations, uh, Department of Labor, Department of Social Development, Agriculture, Home Affairs, uh, SASA and so forth, all, all involved. Um, our second work stream focused on the companies that had big contracts with uh, Saldana Steel, with the steel plant. So these are subcontracting companies, mostly engineering companies. Uh, and the aim there was to provide direct support and keep some of those SMEs uh, viable and alive. Um, our efforts included uh, a, a, an immediate survey. We got hold of 24 of the subcontracting companies. Um, they showed an average of about 80% dependency on Mittal as their major client. Um, and between the 20 or so companies, they employed between 10 and 40 workers each. Uh, so this was a good few hundred jobs um, under threat just by direct subcontracting um, to the, the steel plant. Um, this, the IDZ jumped in as well and launched what they call a collab. This is an SME support center where small businesses can uh, access Wi-Fi, meeting rooms, um, and also some administrative support. Um, this was a site office when they were in major construction and they've turned it into um, a business support center and they helped quite a few of these subcontractors also apply for assistance from the likes of CEDA, um, et cetera, Ment mentoring help, financing help, and so on. Then our third initiative was uh, focused on the downstream industries. I'm not going to go into this too much. Um, my colleague, Mr. Vada, referred to this. Um, we focused on uh, Duferco, who's a direct next level processor of, of the output products of the plant. Uh, and we were just slightly involved in trying to look at other downstream uh, affected companies, but um, but the DTI did most of those engagements. Our, our fourth um, uh, initiative was around the sale or the repurposing of the plant, and um, and those major efforts were also mentioned by the DTI and by Mr. Foster already. Uh, maybe I can just also show a few pictures of what the Heifeld steel model looks like. In fact, um, between AMSA, ourselves, and the DTIC, we were headed to visit the, the Highfield steel plant um, in March, but the, the, those travels were also impacted by, by the lockdown. Um, but we have started doing some technical work and talking to people who bring proposals uh, for some of the repurposing portions of the plant, including logistics and other potential processing options. But this is this will be an ongoing process with uh, with ArcelorMittal and uh, and the DTIC, of course. Our fifth work stream looked at fast tracking fast tracking some of the investments that we have been looking at over time. In any case, but we put uh, together a, a, a very focused investment team looking at landing some of the investments to help mitigate for some of the shock into this relatively small economy uh, where Mittal plays uh, obviously a relatively large role. And some of these have been, um, have been efforts through provincial and national government to look at small economies where there are large corporate players making up a, a, a big proportion of the economy, trying to make sure that these companies remain viable and sustainable. Um, and so some of these investment attractions were quite successful. The IDZ has obviously been at it for, for a while. Um, they attracted another 300 million rands worth of investment uh, early this year. Um, and of course, we were trying to create two to 5,000 jobs in the IDZ in the next five years 
from the existing base. Um, unfortunately, there's now a, a minus 1,000 or 2,000 in the community, which we now have to fill up first before we can start adding to the number. Um, and now, of course, uh, the, the, the economic shock of post-COVID re recession might add to the woes a little bit. Um, so we followed up on some of the major leads that we've scanned in our investment portfolio. We've, uh, we, we're looking at investments in and outside of the IDZ. Um, there's some three major beneficiation projects that we are trying to attract. There's some large marine uh, steel fabrication projects, one of which is a big infrastructure investment and the others are more project-based um, 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 investments. And then a specialized manufacturing investment. And we have quite a bit of detail on these um, potential investments, but with many of them, we need to sign non-disclosure agreements um, and the technical detail, I mean, can keep us busy for hours, but that's just a quick overview of some of the investment options that we are trying to fast track. Our, our sixth initiative was obviously to communicate well. The community is um, under pressure and in distress, um, and we wanted to make sure that workers and even people coming to the area to look for jobs Understood, understood what was going on. So there was a range of um, statements around the wind down, some some uh, invitations to the Career Resilience Open Days, um, real clear information about the SME support that's available. Um, and in fact, I, I in the next slide, I show a little bit of the coverage in some of the large newspapers and news sites, but also the local um, newspapers and uh, social media sites carried quite a lot of information. We were covered on five radio stations um, and there was a lot of detail given around the effect. Uh, it was obviously quite big news in Saldana, but, uh, but nationally as well. Uh, just to conclude, perhaps uh, I want to point out, uh, if I may, Chairperson, that these relationships with industry that we as a department and some of our other partners have are long-term relationships um, and the DTIC team will, will vouch for this um, with the way that they've been interacting with AMSA and other large players. Uh, in the Saldana area, we, we're doing a fair amount of effort through the West Coast Industrial Plan to stay in touch with companies. Um, we've recently uh, done some energy solutions for quite large factories in our area. Um, with, the, with the COVID crisis, we've been doing a lot of support to companies to make sure that they can sustain their operations, especially the ones who remained open under the lockdown, like doing food processing and other essential services. Um, and so these longer term relationships really are very valuable when one hits a crisis and we see it, we saw it when, uh, when Saldana Steel started the wind down and we definitely see it now that, um, that COVID-19 has hit the economy quite harshly. Um, I think also the, the 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 fact that we could do a very rapid response from the November announcement to a December start of the task team with multiple players coming together uh, was a good testimony to to a lot of the good um, relationships and social capital that has been built. Um, we tried to focus on economic shocks because we knew that this was one of many shocks, like I mentioned, the drought before and some energy issues, and then. Uh, the plant closure and, of course, now uh, the bigger uh, global health crisis shock. Um, and we want to be certain and clear to the investment community that Saldana still offers um, a lot of opportunities. Our industrial drive is still going strong and the IDZ's um, hopefully going strongly. We'll, we'll, we're, we're obviously in a period of uncertainty and we've had the standing committee there late last year. We hope to see uh, all the members there again soon when some of our investors start operating. There are three uh, big investments uh, in the IDZ that are that are, are waiting to for the building sites to open again on the 1st of June. So there's definitely a lot of activity. And then finally, perhaps to mention that some of our institutional structures that we've built over time have really worked extremely well. Um, the relationships built and the the, and, and these are not just relationships as in you know who to call, but working relationships having worked on projects through the whole of society approach pilot project in Saldana, as well as the joint district approach uh, in the West Coast district, really provided great preparation for um, for the metal closure or, or wind down, as well as for the COVID crisis that we're in now. And a lot of work streams have come together very quickly to respond uh, to provide resilience assistance, not only in the community, but also even directly um, to businesses. 
Thank you very much, Chair. I, I hope I didn't rush it too much, but I didn't want to keep the committee uh, uh, too long. Uh, there's some email addresses for inquiries to the ministry and, and ourselves as the department. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Jonker. And I'm always very impressed at how our committee, that the presentations are always short, sweet, and simple. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Members, I'm going to jump straight into questions. There is a function between the little three dots. There's a little hand that you can raise your hand. It's between the dots and the show conversation. If members have any questions, if you can click the little hand and then I'll be able to note the respective members. Going once, questions going twice. Does no one have questions? Am I going to be the only one asking questions? Let's see, I saw a hand going up. Under Rolf van der Westeisen, you may go. Member van der Westeisen, you may ask your question. Sorry, Chief. Yes. Just, um, unmuting myself was a bit problematic. Uh, Chair, can I just uh, thank you very much for the presentations. And Chair, uh, as I said here, I, I appreciate the fact that eventually people uh, in Mr. Fester's position are not responsible to try and save a plant, but to try and save a company for the future of South Africa. Uh, the one uh, aspect that has not been touched on in a particularly export uh, uh, orientated organization is the whole issue of the exchange rate. Uh, and I would appreciate if he could just expand on 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 how the ex exchange rate uh, changes uh, could perhaps uh, change the scenario for uh, AMSA in general, but then particularly perhaps for the uh, Saldana plant. That's my first question. The second one is just, were any of the uh, employees or former employees in Saldana uh, uh, able to benefit from the TERS uh, UIF uh, uh, benefit, which, um, which you know, uh, many other employees uh, affected by the COVID crisis were able to, to benefit or was the the restructuring process a little bit too too quick or too soon in that in that regard. Thank you very much. Thank you, Member van der Westeisen. Honorable Kondla, I saw your hand in the chat box, but before that, Mr. Jonker, is it possible for you to unshare your presentation, please? Just so that if members want to use their video, then they are able to do so. Thank you, Member Kondla. Thank you, Chairperson, um, and thank you for the, the presentations. Um, maybe let me start by saying, I think um, one appreciates um, the, 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 the global context uh, within which uh, ArcelorMittal is a, a, a big uh, a, a sort of corporate entity operates in. Um, um, but also, I think as we do that, um, the, my take at this point would be the local environment. And I think that is one thing that triggered the, the, the interest into this. And I want to follow up uh, just on questions to, uh, to the different uh, presenters. One, I, now that the, the whole decision to close the plant was taken in June 2009, I'm interested uh, to know both uh, from Acelo Mittal in particular and uh, DTI, who has been in conversation for some time, uh, what would have been, you know, the implications that they understood? Uh, because I think uh, in the DTI presentation, I think the speaker or the presenter was making the point, you know, of the impact of big corporates in local economies. 
uh, both from a, a, a job uh, a creation point of view, but also, as it was said, you know, uh, the, some of the downstream uh, activities. So what exactly during those conversations, um, you know, was the intention of trying, you know, to manage in a better way what has actually happened to date? Because as we speak now, you know, uh, my take is that that particular economy has a, a double whammy is the COVID and uh, 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 which uh, actually followed after, you know, uh, the loss, you know, of income, of other things, of families in that particular economy. So that's the first point that I would like DTI and, and, and AMSA to speak to. And um, I'm interested if AMSA is going to be able to provide us in this session or even, uh, you know, even if they can follow up. On in the, the numbers that uh, I think were mentioned in terms of direct and indirect jobs, including the supply chain, can we get specifically from that uh, uh, particular uh, uh, Saldana uh, area? How many are we talking about, uh, both in percentage-wise and also in, 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 in numbers? And then uh, to quickly move uh, from, from that chair, I'm, I'm interested, I, I hear DTIC speaking about a master plan, <coughs> and I'm not sure whether what is the relationship between the master plan mentioned by DTIC and West Coast Industrial Plan that DDET was, was speaking about. Because one of the things that I think we, we saw as a response post uh, the, 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 the initial uh, stages of the closing down of the plant was one. There was a provincial uh, uh, intervention. There is also discussion of the DTIC. Now, my question is, is there an intergovernmental response to the steel uh, situation in particular in that West Coast? So that is why I'm asking whether this West Coast industrial plan is part of the, 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 the master plan that was referred to, or these are two parallel processes, uh, because I'm ver very much interested on how, you know, the efforts um, uh, uh, are being uh, coordinated in a better way to realize more uh, uh, returns, you know, for that particular uh, uh, local economy and, and, and also the workers there. My last one, Chair, is specifically to, to, to DDET. I think with the with the plans uh, uh, and also the objectives of the task team that was mentioned, and I think uh, 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 the provincial minister did mention early in the year about you know the objectives and the work that has been done. What is of interest to me, one, is that uh, what were the key objectives of their of their interventions? I've I've heard him talking about direct support and keeping SMMEs viable and alive, and I'm wanting to check. To date, has that been achieved? If so, if you can give details to that, and what cost has been attached to actually do that particular work uh, by DDED and the relevant, because I understand that also the Sardana municipality is is is, is actually part uh, of, of this work. So I'll end there for, for now, Chair. Thank you very much. Thank you, Honorable Mkondlo. Are there any other questions from members? Okay, if not, then I will ask mine now as well, since we we have some extra time there. Now, um, I understand that it's 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 been a difficult it's been a difficult situation, and silver metal and Saldana steel is not just important for the Western Cape, but it's obviously also important for South Africa given its footprint, especially with. South Africa trying to move towards energy and water security. And one would thus think that an industry such as this would be thriving. And with COVID-19, um, the lockdown has obviously exacerbated already stressed industries. Um, some of the other members have already asked some of my questions. The extra ones that I have, I just would like to assist with the, um, with the assistance with reskilling of employees, I just want to find out what have the roles of AMSA, DTI, and DDAT been specifically with that reskilling. I know DDAT mentioned that there's a list of organizations who assisted employees and workers, especially with the exhibition. Is it possible for us to get a list 
of those respective um, organizations. And if we can perhaps also get some context on why only 14% of the AMSA workers and employees um, attended, is it only because those particular employees wanted to attend or is, um, is there anything else particularly? In slide nine of the AMSA presentation, you mentioned factors um, that you took in consideration, consideration for the profitability of the company, such as electricity, port, rail, iron ore pricing, as well as the domestic coal. And I just would like to understand specifically what do you mean by those particular factors. I know that you've sent us some extra information about electricity last year, but we can just specifically know if it's a port related factor that has affected the pricing, how has it affected, for example? Um, and then you mentioned on one slide, I apologize, I don't remember the slide number now, um, the assets for future use that you would like to work on, that's on the AMSA presentation. You mentioned renewable energy, the logistical hub, inland ports, and water treatment for municipalities and that you, for example, receive some interest regarding the renewable energy. And I would just like to know um, what type of interest have you been receiving? The port, for example, you indicated that you are working on a new project, possibly, that may even employ a possible equal amount of people as previously. Is there any information you can give us regarding this? And, okay, Andrew Bonkondo already asked the one regarding the steel master plan. If possible, if DTI could perhaps send this to us, if it is not um, a DTI plan, is it AMSA, is it DTI, where do we find this? As well as DTI mentioned that the SARS reference price system for steel, is it possible for us to receive that as well? And finally, on slide 15 for DTI, the high felt industrial part. I just want to find out um, whether it would be possible for the committee to, to visit um, the park and possibly even invite our Western Cape Committee of Transport and Public Works. The chairperson actually also sits on this committee as well. And then for DDAT, um, okay, I already asked the one on the assisting of the employees and workers, but I just want to also find out, you mentioned that you are currently assisting companies in the Sedana Bay area with energy solutions as well as other assistance. And I would just like some clarity on what type of assistance is being offered to especially the companies that are linked to AMSA, especially in the downstream respective sector. And possibly is um, Saldana an economic hotspot? And if not, why not? If so, how is this being dealt with in terms of the whole of society approach that you mentioned previously? Thank you, those are my questions. I know we have a bit of a mouthful of questions from members. Um, I will then ask AMSA, do you want to go first with answering of questions? Yes, uh, sure. I will. I will go and I will take them uh, from the top. Okay, uh, uh, Mr. Ferrester, just before you start, I just want to remind you: if there is any confidential information to answers that um, confidential information, if you can just indicate beforehand before re releasing any information of of such a nature, please, because then the committee members can can consider um, discussing um, the way forward on that, please. All right, Chair, now we'll do that. So the first question was around the, the currency uh, and the impact of that. Uh, <clears throat> obviously, it has a, a positive impact normally. Uh, so a weaker currency will give a benefit from a profitability perspective. But in Saldana's case, as an example, iron ore, uh, coal, local iron ore and coal are all priced in dollar terms. It's got quite a huge expense in terms of imported coke as well as imported pallets. So uh, Saldana would be, I, and I'm, I'm gonna say around 70% of its inputs are linked directly or indirectly to exchange rates. You'll get a benefit, but you'll get a, a small benefit relative to the movement in the currency. Simultaneously to that, over the last year and two years, you have a, a, a oversupply of steel globally and you have 
countries protecting their, their markets, like the U.S., direct protection of 25% and downstream substantially more. The EU is protecting uh, steel imports through quota system. So typically, your uh, countries that normally export to those developed countries are now focusing on markets where we used to operate, like East Africa. So you will have a, a depressed pricing uh, environment in East Africa. Uh, that will most probably eat up the benefit that you can get from an exchange rate. Um, so it will have an impact, but I think for a restart consideration of Solgana, there has to be a sustained uh, a change in the cost dynamics. The next question, uh, Chairperson, was around the uh, employees. Um, obviously, we have uh, uh, normally a scheme in place to assist employees to apply for different uh, positions and work, um, uh, assist them with their CVs, um, um, direct them into application for UIF, so they have benefited from the UIF different than the current scenario where the company apply. Under a, a retrenchment scenario, you're actually not employed and individuals apply uh, themselves. We've also uh, tried to the extent possible to redeploy people from Saldana uh, to some of our other plants where we have a skills gap. Uh, very limited success uh, by nature, people in the Western Cape uh, prefer to stay there. <clears throat> the, uh, there was a question around, uh, have we envisaged the impact uh, on uh, of the closure? I think we have obviously considered the impact directly, uh, which was around 600 uh, permanent uh, employees and around 500 subcontractors. That was the direct impact. The indirect impact, I think, uh, most probably we can, if the committee requires, uh, do an estimate on that. Uh, but we'll have the numbers in terms of uh, indirect taxes uh, and contributions uh, to, to others. We also consider the impact. I mean, we are supporting the uh, uh, education uh, in that area where we have the Ashwamittal uh, University. Um, we continue to support that uh, from Thunderbell Park. Uh, we do support some social uh, investments there. Uh, we have taken a view to continue to support that from our uh, Thunderbell contributions. <clears throat> the, uh, there was a question around the cost factors, uh, energy and port and which are uh, more relevant. I think, uh, uh, as we previously stated, uh, Saldana, as an example, a minimal high energy consumption. Uh, and we believe that uh, our energy tariffs that we pay uh, is far in excess of our competitors elsewhere in the world. So a company from China or Russia that we have to compete with in East Africa does not have the structural disadvantages uh, from uh, energy perspective, as an example. Port, being an export uh, exporter, port charges in South Africa is most probably of the highest in the world. So if you combine all of those and you do not have a raw material competitive advantage as well, it becomes almost impossible to effectively compete uh, in the international market. Chair, you ask around the, the uh, more clarity around the, the future use uh, or the repurposing, uh, as we put it. Uh, I think important, which I probably didn't articulate uh, uh, in my presentation, when we talk about the repurposing, it's the repurposing of the non-operational part of the Saldana environment. So uh, I, I don't want the steel making facilities to be vandalized or put in a position that it cannot be reused. So if for some reason dynamics change in three or five years, the restart will always be possible. 
So we're talking about uh, the, the property, uh, rail sidings, uh, logistical facilities um, <clears throat> that we want to use. You asked for more information. Um, I, I think that's a bit sensitive in the sense that we are in a bidding process. Uh, I'm happy to discuss that uh, with your yourselves in a, in a most probably in a week or two. We will be in a much better advanced stage around that, and potentially what jointly or assistance can be can be uh, discussed to accelerate the process. Uh, because remember, as long as Saldana still remain under care and maintenance, it remains a financial burden. So the quicker we can we can fast track some repurposing other activities, uh, the better for us. <clears throat> On your last question around uh, types of renewable energy, this specific referred to energy from gas uh, and uh, LPG specifically. Uh, where there's an interested party, uh, there's a, a property available, there's already an EIA done. Uh, so uh, a lot of the work uh, and legislative type of stuff has been done by us over the years. So it can actually be accelerated quite quickly. So we are in, in uh, we, we and, and a counterpart has jointly issued uh, an inquiry into the market uh, for people to participate uh, in that energy project. Um, also, uh, to the extent that the working committee on uh, on Soldana or the Western Cape wants more detail, more involvement, uh, we are comfortable, uh, Chairperson, to to engage on that. It's not uh, it's not a, a highly secretive uh, endeavour. Um, Chair, I think I've dealt with the questions that was uh, passed on my way. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Fester. Um, I'm going to now ask for DTI, Ms. Pele and your team, if you are able to, to take your questions now. Uh, thanks, thanks, uh, Honourable Chairperson. Um, there were a couple of questions. Sorry, can I stay with my video off? My connection is a bit bad, so if I switch on the video, I feel like I'm not being too audible. Um, no problem, Ms. Pele, we understand. All right, um, there were a couple of questions that have been asked around the steel uh, and metal fabrication uh, master plan. Um, I think the point to underscore is that uh, the master plan development process uh, uh, is still underway. The minister has appointed a facilitator that is assisting us to put together uh, uh, this uh, 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 document and the plan going forward. Um, and we are also talking about what are the kind of projects and programs that must uh, actually anchor the, the master plan. Um, yes, there will be... Uh, uh, some level of intergovernmental process that is going to be needed. Obviously, the master plan is developed by us as a, a national government department. will focus more on national programs. You know, like, for example, as I was talking on the kind of support that we have already provided to the sector, the kind of support that we provide as the DTI will cut across all provinces. So there is a need for some level of interaction and, and coordination with the provinces because the provinces through the economic development departments are also able to provide additional support to their own uh, industries within the provincial structures. So I, I, I really believe that the two documents should mutually reinforce one another. Uh, some of the things that the province will be looking for could be achieved better if they are coordinated nationally. Some of the uh, activities that industry might need at the regional level are better of coordinated through the provincial uh, um, strategies. So yes, indeed, uh, the, the two uh, will, 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 will work in tandem. The process itself is still underway. Uh, as, the, as soon as the master plan is completed uh, and we have, uh, it's been signed off by the social partners, yes, we can appraise the committee on what is the thinking and, and also share the documentation. Uh, we're still in the development phase once, as I've already indicated on the last slide, that the intention is to complete the entire process within this financial year. So once we are at the point where the document is matured and it's been signed off, we will definitely make it available to the public and also to the committee itself. Um, there was also a question around um, 
what was the intention and what were we trying to achieve with our engagement with uh, AMSA? As I indicated, AMSA is a very strategic and important player into the steel industry. Um, the Saudana plan for us, uh, 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 from an industrial policy perspective, one, it houses very good uh, uh, capabilities. Uh, this, and I mean, within the stable of the steel uh, mills that we have in South Africa, the Saudana steel for us, uh, it's a bit of a newer mill. It's got very good technology that we can take forward uh, into, uh, into the future. Um, so we don't want to lose the industrial capabilities. We do not want to lose jobs. And it's for that reason where we have been engaging with AMSA to find a way of mitigating uh, uh, the, the closure of the plant to ensure that we sustain our industrial capabilities going forward. The product itself is important, particularly in the roof sheeting industry. Um, as we are building new RDP houses, new commercial buildings, we're going to continue requiring uh, this kind of product to also be made available on um, to the domestic needs. There's a growing market on the African continent, uh, which I think it presents an opportunity for us to uh, think, rethink around how we can reposition some of the products that have traditionally been produced in, in, in Saldana. Um, and especially as we are going into the implementation of the continental free trade area, that we, we, we begin to also identify the kind of programs and projects and products for that matter that we should be positioning to actually take advantage of this growing uh, continental uh, um, demand. So for us, uh, industrial capabilities, industrial capacity is very important to our industrial policy. There's no industrial policy. We do not have an industrial base. So sustaining what we are currently having and, and, and it's for that reason where we have worked so hard to make sure that we bring high felt back on stream in a different configuration, but to ensure that we sustain the capabilities into the domestic uh, economy. Um, I, I, I don't know if uh, my colleagues would like to add, Omisha and Mohammed. Uh, just just one thing. Um, if you all wish to visit Haifal, just send a note. Uh, even uh, Herman can also uh, touch base with uh, with uh, Johan uh, at, at Haifal. Um, thank you, Tandy. If I can just add um, that um, the DTIC continues to engage and support all efforts to um, save Soldana and the jobs. Um, as well as participate in the various initiatives, including um, with the Western Cape. And um, this is an ongoing um, endeavor. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Pele. Uh, let me just see if those are all of the questions. Yes, I think those are all. Uh, DDAT? If you could take your questions now, please. Okay. Uh, Thank you. Uh, yes, sorry. <laughs> Thank you, Honorable Chair. I'm going to ask Edmund first to go, and then I'm going to do uh, um, perhaps answer, uh, do the sweeping of the, the rest of the questions that Edmund doesn't answer. Thanks. Uh, Chairperson, uh, uh, thank you, Joanne. Also, uh, I'm going to answer the, all the easy questions and leave the difficult ones for my boss. Um, um, I'd like to just point to some of what I heard um, Honourable Member Nkondlo ask around um, whether we've achieved any success in supporting some of the businesses in Saldana. So um, in our report that we sent to the Standing Committee, we showed that of the 24 companies we've engaged, 13 of them, so just over half of them, gave us really detailed information of the impact on their business um, of the closure or wind down of the, of the steel plant. And all of them, almost all of them, went through a little bit of a process with us, um, some applying for assistance. I think there were five applications that we facilitated. I'm afraid I don't have feedback on whether those five applications for assistance were successful or not. Uh, what I can say is that two of three of the companies have given us some report back. One was that they used excess capacity in their company for training, and they've uh, partnered with the IDZ to to make training space and capabilities available. Um, and so their loss of capacity was was offered into um, into some quite high tech um, uh, engineering training. And then another company who gave us a, a little bit of feedback around how in their retrenchment process, um, they were able to connect with some of their industry 
uh, downstream industry clients in the Northern Cape and of, I think the, 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 the number was more than 70% of the people that they had to let go uh, had found other jobs because they were quite specialized in, uh, I think, hydraulics and the specialized hydraulic uh, skills were quite were in good demand. So a, a large proportion of the people were able to find jobs elsewhere. And obviously it's sad for the West Coast to lose those expertise, but it's, um, it's, uh, it's reassuring to know that technical, highly technically skilled people uh, are still able to find other options in the market. Um, um, uh, Honourable Nkondo, I, I, I can't really answer on what cost was um, expended in that SME support work. What we did was to put together a task team of about five or six people, including the DTI, some of the business organisations in the area, um, um, the IDZ, uh, the municipality was involved, and there was a there was prior to the to the wind down. Also, there was. Um, Quite a lot of support given to the West Coast Business Development Centre, um, the, the and and money was spent on a turnaround for the centre, a new business plan for the centre, and we're actually in the process now, especially in our COVID response, to try and get proper funding agreements for the West Coast Business Development Centre in combination with the collab of the um, of the IDZ, and we, we've got uh, at the centre and at the at the collab we've got an average of about between 10 and 20 companies per day using those facilities to try and do applications for COVID, um, for, for COVID relief packages. So it seems that there's in the order of tens, tens to twenties of companies per day coming there, either to fill in forms, to use the fax and Wi-Fi facilities, or even to ask for administrative help with applying for um, either the TERS or the UIF or, or even some of the um, even some of the guarantee finance, um, finance guarantee um, schemes. Um, and then maybe just a quick response, um, Chairperson, to your question around the 14% the, the uh, of AMSA employees. It's, it's not actually 14% of the empl affected employees that, that uh, attended the days. It was of the 1,200 people that attended those open days, 14% of those were people directly um, affected by the AMSA wind down. So, so I think that the number was something like 177 out of the 500 odd workers that were retrenched. So that's probably uh, a, a good 40% um, margin. So, so it's a big, big portion of the affected employees, but a small portion of the 1200 odd people from the community that came out for assistance. Um, and those those support organizations um, are all listed in a report that we that we sent to the committee earlier, but we're, we're, we can definitely um, send a, a, a list of all the all the support organisations that were at those open days. Um, I had one. Oh, the, the the last question, chairperson, that I'd like to answer. You you asked about other companies that we supported in the area, and I mentioned Energy Solutions and some of the others. Um, these are uh, uh, quite a wide range of companies. One was a fish factory. Uh, the other was a transport company, and so. As a department, we're in touch with with quite a few of the large corporates and um, through some of the business organisations with the smaller uh, companies. And some of the requests are fairly random, and we just jump in and try to uh, create an ease of doing business um, environment. So, the energy solution was around getting a certain factory to be on load curtailment rather than load shedding. And between us and the municipality and that factory, quite a bit of technical work had to be done on how the electricity gets through the municipal system and which switches uh, can and can't be turned on and off at what times during the during some of the load shedding periods. And also then getting the approval from ESCOM for that company to be on load curtailment. So there's, it was a bunch of technical work. Another example was um, a factory who wanted to give their staff normal four-strain flu vaccines uh, just to make sure that people don't get the normal flu while at work, and then there's a stigma of them possibly having uh, COVID-19. So, so uh, the, the company reached out to us and said they could get only so many uh, units of vaccine, and there's a national shortage. And we jumped in, contacted the the pharmaceutical company and one of the local um, retailers, because the pharmaceutical company is only allowed to sell to the retailer. And we opened the channel for them to access uh, quite a high number of, of four strain flu vaccines. So, so it's it's quite random and it's a mix across the board. It's not necessarily downstream industries um, 
to Saldana Steel, and and maybe also a last answer in answer to Member Kondlo's question and yours, Chair, is that the the, the Warsa work before had gone around four themes in the economy. One of them was um, SME support, and and now with the wind down having established that small task team, the SME support intensified, and we're in COVID-19 response now, and the 24 odd companies that we dealt with uh, under the Saldana Steel wild wind down has now ballooned, obviously, and we're working with the local business organizations. One has 180 members, the other has 120 members. Uh, the third one, I can't remember the numbers, but so all of a sudden now this little task team of five people having dealt with 24 companies now have 300 companies that we're relatively directly dealing with. So it's definitely beyond our, our capacity to immediately serve per company um, needs. And so we've asked these organizations to do surveys amongst their members and bring out the highlighted needs. And then we will respond more structurally with, uh, for example, CEDA coming in with the with a financing solution, etc. So, so we're building an ecosystem of support rather than um, now dealing with individual company support anymore. Um, and the difficult questions, I'm afraid uh, I'll leave to my boss. <laughs> Why, thank you, Herman. Um... Okay, so I just want to add some of the uh, points that uh, Herman basically made, and one that's with regards to the attendance of the AMSA employees at the career resilience. So the strategy that we adopted, uh, particularly for the employees, because some of the employees are fairly high, highly skilled, um, and so their requirement or, or the, 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 the ability to easily find employment was probably uh, much greater than some of your lower level employees within the plant. Um, and so it, it, it was likely that they would not necessarily attend the career resilience uh, um, um, meetings or the, the uh, event that we had uh, set up. So that's the first issue. But there were, there were a couple of things. So one was for the employees affected by the wind down, there were three aspects of what could have happened. So one is that they needed to obviously find employment so for some, as I said earlier, it would have been easier uh, than others. The second is that they would have probably needed some degree of upskilling um, uh, in order to find employment, given the limitations of employment in the area. So there was a bit of upskilling, reskilling, and that's to a certain extent what the career resilience uh, uh, event provided. And then the third area was that some of them could possibly have become entrepreneurs. So it's to set up a business and not necessarily look for a, a, another job. So that was another aspect that we actually looked at, and that was dealt with uh, through the collab that was established by the IDZ. Um, and some of it was also established or dealt with within the workshop that we've done. So those are the sort of, sort of three avenues for the directly impacted workers, and that's essentially what our intervention spoke to. So, so that was the, the, the first thing. We do have a list of the organizations that have been involved, and that would have been uh, the West Coast um, TVET colleges. Uh, there was the Department of Agriculture, because agriculture is obviously a fairly large sector in the West Coast. So the ones that were relevant to the West Coast were the ones that we actually highlighted. Then, of course, the department's uh, skill interventions was also made and shared uh, with, with, uh, with at the workshop. So, so that was the first issue around the reskilling issue and the attendance, right? The reason why we had done the second workshop, we were planning to do the second workshop in May, was to capture those employees that might not have made it, wanted to attend, but might not have been able to make it. And so that's why we had the second workshop, so that we have a wider catchment. We weren't necessarily expecting 100% of the employees from AMSA uh, to actually attend it, given the fact that there were the other options that were available to them. What the workshops, however, showed was that there was a demand beyond just obviously the AMSA crisis. Um, so the fact that we had over 1,200 people from the community attend spoke to an un unmet demand um, and the idea was not only that we were intending to roll out the workshops again to have another set of it but was actually to start looking at rolling this out perhaps across the the province and in that uh, the department of 
local government uh, and social development, uh, we've been working with them around having a much more regular engagement or rolling out similar types of engagements across the province in going forward. The COVID uh, obviously kind of stopped the, or paused the work, um, but the intention is to kind of roll these things out across communities across the, the province. Um, so that, that was just the issue around that. With regards to Saldana and the West Coast being a hotspot, yes, there is a concern. Um, and at the moment, we are busy refining the hotspot strategy um, that not only looks at the West Coast, but also looks across uh, involving all the other uh, departments across the province as hotspots arise. What the department strategy is, is uh, it's, it's, we are in the process of refining it, but on the one hand, it's making sure that there are guidelines. So companies and businesses are aware of safety guidelines that they need to implement within the, the work in the workplace to make sure that they are safe, the issues around social distancing um, and uh, strategies like staggering work hours, et cetera, et cetera. So those guidelines we basically finalized and we had worked together with the Department of Health uh, uh, with regards to that. So it conforms to their safety uh, sort of concerns around uh, thermometer testing, et cetera, et cetera, and then the testing regime. So that's the one thing that we are doing. And then the second major pillar, if you like, um, is, uh, is, is compliance. So it's, you know, you could share the guidelines, make make businesses aware uh, of that through working one directly with the businesses, but also through the associations. But the second is with this compliance. And the compliance essentially is we have a hot a hotline, if you like, um, of reporting non-compliance. And we're working very closely with the Department of Labor around that. So in certain cases, non-compliance is, uh, or the reporting of the non-compliance is one, where businesses may be interpreting the guidelines incorrectly, and we provide them support to make sure that they rectify that. Um, the second is the expectations of whoever does the reporting um, or, or uh, of non-compliance. So sometimes that's customers, sometimes it's workers, and that's maybe because they have unrealistic expectations of what's possible and what they should be doing. So it's not necessarily conforming to the Department of Health's uh, understanding of what's good safety practices. So that's the managing the expectations of the customers or workers. And we are speaking to the, the unions with regards to that. Because of, and then the third issue is that there's an outright non-compliance. Um, and so the outright non-compliance is where businesses are actually deliberately and knowingly circumventing the, the guidelines or not practicing good safety measures. And there the Department of Labor comes in where they essentially go to the businesses. They temporarily close them down um, until and then provide support to make sure that they are compliant. But I think the intention is one to try and keep those businesses open. So it's really around a proactive, constructive uh, support measures to make sure that businesses are practicing safe um, practices. Uh, and then two, where there's outright uh, defiance, if you like, of the com of the rules, is to close those businesses uh, down and until they are actually are compliant, but to provide support for them to get there. So at the moment, uh, the West Coast is not yet uh, considered a hotspot, but we have uh, essentially assigned people. We will be assigning people if it does happen, and we're preparing for that. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair. Thank you so much, Ms. Johnson. According to my notes, I think all of the questions have been answered. Members, are there any follow-up questions? Going once. Yes, Chairperson. Andre Van Kondlo. No problem, Andre Van Kondlo, yes, you may ask your question. Yes, Chair. I, I would... Um... I think the the, the, the questions, uh, uh, Chair, uh, were answered, and thank you for the for the responses. I think um, I've got more comments and suggestion on on trying to get. I think the information, the specificities, I think of the information. But I think the colleagues would always have to appreciate that ours is oversight. 
and obvious, obviously in an oversight function, uh, as much as you would want to understand, you know, the, the input results, you know, what people are, are doing, you know, to realize the objective. We're also wanting, you know, the specifics, whether are we moving, if we're intending on doing something, how far is that? You know, I think that for me, it helps me to understand if indeed there is progress or lack thereof so that we can then be, be able to see what role do we play as the legislature, you know, in supporting, you know, growing and sustaining our economies and the local economy at this point. So I think that's my comment of more of a generalized type of responses because they become frustrating. Well, now you must go come back and be asking in detail. The, the, now I would want to suggest, Chair, and I'm happy with what uh, AMSA has said, that they can come back to us in terms of the, you know, the cost to the protection and maintenance of the plant um, in a more uh, a closed, uh, perhaps, uh, environment. That I, I, I would like us to, to take up that opportunity, and thank you very much. And then I also wanted, uh, Chair, maybe we can get more information about the, I'm not sure whether it's part of that, the repurposing of the high felt uh, steel plant. Uh, I heard that also DDED was busy uh, planning for a, a, a visit. If we can get more information about uh, that particular project uh, to understand also its relationship. And my last one Chair, is just a comment. I think once again, from where I'm sitting, when I listen to the response of DTI and what the province is saying, I'm still and not convinced that, that there is. I hear that, yes, we there is ongoing support and endeavor. I don't think at this point that is what we want to hear. We really want to hear that there is an integration in terms of how national government and the other spheres of government are working together in responding. Because whilst I take the DTIC as a role of a national, but that national, as we said in this instance, is working in a particular local environment. So, Chair, in this issue of a master plan and a South West, West Coast, you know, a coast, a, a sort of plan, I would think that there is more. And maybe as a committee, we need to write to, to, to the minister and raise that as, as a concern, because I would think that is a constitutional imperative that the, the three spheres must always never you know, work in silos in such a manner that a citizen who understand one government is placed in an environment where, you know, services are, are going all over the place. So I want, I think that's a comment I wanted to make and suggest that I think we write to the minister and ask that between the province, including our provincial uh, minister, I think that we must see more an uh, effort of trying to integrate the work, especially that has to do with how we deal with the, with the steel and the future thereof in the in the West Coast and Saldana uh, environment in particular. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Honorable Nkondlo. Regarding your comment of specificities, um, I advise that we take it up in the resolutions. Um, regarding the repurposing of high felt visit, I think I was the one who asked whether we can visit, and I think the department already answered that that would be possible, but the department can correct me if I'm wrong. Um, and regarding the DTI and prov province and letter in this regard, I think we can discuss it under, under resolutions. Is there any um, answers or comments from AMSA, DTI or DDET to any of the matters Honorable Kondlo has raised? Going once, going twice. Okay. As, hi, did someone speak? Yes, it's me, Chairperson is Tandy. Okay, Ms. Pele, thank you. Uh, thanks, Chairperson. Um, we take note of the comment from Honorable Nkondo uh, about the intergovernmental uh, process. I think it's a point that we need to take forward and ensure that as we are implement, developing and implementing the plans, we take the three spheres on government into confidence and we work in tandem with one another. Um, I think it's a point that we, we take to heart and I think we will improve on the on that process working together with the province and the key uh, municipal structures uh, going forward. On the high field uh, visit, I think we we can make a way to assist the committee to visit the the, the, the complex. Uh, probably, I think once we have bit we are a bit clear around the travel movements and the COVID restrictions, uh, we should be able to to find a way of uh, making the arrangement with the with the management of the complex. Thanks. 
Thank you, Ms. Pele. Any other comments or um, answers for Honorable Nkwonto? Going once, going twice. Okay, um, I have a few follow up questions. Um, <clears throat> um, Mr. Fister, you mentioned that as part of the renewable energy answer, that some that the possible interested party that you are working with over the past few years will be energy from gas from LPG, but I'm not sure if I heard correctly. Is it LPG or LNG? Because I know there is a big push for liquid natural gas in the Saldana Bay area as well. So I just wanted to understand that. And if it is LPG, whether um, there's any possibility for moving into the LNG sector. Um, for DDAT, I wanted to find out, and this is also probably for DTI. So we've seen obviously that the winding down of AMSA, for example, is occurring. What can DDAT and DTI on provincial and national levels do in order to try and prevent closing downs of companies within the energy and construction industry, such as AMSA, without intervening within business processes and operations. Um, I do think that as government, the role is to ensure that an environment is created where businesses in South Africa are striving and um, able to be competitive on a global level. And um, to the to DDAT, um, you mentioned that it was 177 workers out of the 500 workers that attended the exhibition, which is approximately 40% margin. So just want to find out, yes, I understand that some people won't attend the exhibition and the skills training because they don't necessarily need to. But I just want to understand, were you able to reach the other 60% with communication of some sort? Um, and have they indicated, um, actually, we don't want to attend? Or is it just one of those things where people just simply did not pitch up because they don't need to, possibly? Um, and then to D that as well, Mr. Yonker, you mentioned that you received five applications from companies for assistance that were SMMEs, but you're not sure if all five were successful. Is it possible that the committee can please be furnished with such information of the success of the applications, if any, or if they are still in process, just to an indication whether those applications are still in process? Thank you. Members, are there any other follow ups? Okay, Mr. Fister, you can go first. All right, Jefferson. Yeah, I think the only question to me was whether it's uh, LPG or LNG. Uh, initially, L, uh, LPG. Uh, so that's the, the first phase uh, anticipated. But later, obviously, uh, a second phase and a second plant will be on the uh, LNG. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Mr. Mo oh, Mr. Mohammed, you had your hand up. Sorry, I didn't see you. You can you can now, Mr. Mohammed. Yes. Uh, yeah. In terms of what we can do to save industries, I mean, uh, there, there is a distress funding at the IDC. So, uh, so like, if there are issues, you can contact me, and I can put you in touch with the IDC to look at possible fundings of companies in distress. Thank you, Mr. Mohammed. Ms. Pele, is there anything from DTI that you would like to add from for the answers or comments? Uh, no, Chair. Um, good. In fact, I struggled to hear your questions, uh, but then I think Mohammed has covered it. Thanks. Mr. Mohammed did cover my question. Yes, thank you. Mr. Yonker, um, you're up next. Yeah, I see you had your hand up. Chair, thank you. Uh, my very quick response to those five applications. Those were different applications to different sets of support. Uh, one or two were through CEDA. One or two were to um, 
to get mentoring support for companies. So we initiated and facilitated those uh, those applications, but the applications did not come to us. We were we were not the ones who received it or are responding to it. So we'll have to just go back to the companies and ask them whether they had success. So if we could be afforded a little bit of time um, for that by the committee, if you don't mind. Um, but we'll definitely get the response and, and go and check whether they were successful. Um, of the 177 out of the 500 odd, um, Chair, I, did, I read it my maths and it's actually closer to 30 odd percent than 40. I, I quickly did 200 out of 500, but it's actually 177 out of 550 odd. So it's maybe closer to 30 percent. Um, maybe the, the, the first round was also a bit quick. The wind down was still underway and not all uh, workers had left the employer of AMSA, the retrenched workers, and also many of the retrenched workers would have had se severance packages which would have supported them for a bit and they were possibly in the process of exercising their options, either looking for other jobs, starting a business uh, or whatever the case may be. So, so we didn't expect really for, for, in fact, we were quite surprised that even 177 uh, direct employees attended that. And, and so the idea was with the second round, which was another month or two later, that we would, uh, that we would get more people there. We, 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 we spoke to EMSA about the possibility of getting uh, direct communication with these employees, but at the time they, the, they were still in the middle of the retrenchment process, and that was governed by uh, section, is it 189? Um, um, and so, so we didn't want to get into that process and communicate directly with workers. We simply asked Mittal then to send the invitation um, on uh, on our behalf. So, so the communication directly to the workers were also through some of the communication channels that Mittal had established in that uh, obviously quite sensitive process. It's regulated by labour legislation, etc. Um, so, so there's now a more consolidated approach for skills development in the area, which is part of a, a, a broader skills approach in our department that had a West Coast leg to it. Um, and we are trying to get um, access to the, at least the skill levels and the types of skills of the people that are no longer working for Mittal, mostly because we know, for example, that the IDZ's new investors are starting to recruit skills. So we want to make sure that there's visibility in the market of those recruiting skills versus those skills that are available in the area. Um, but it's difficult to just go to workers and say, hey, you were a boilermaker, um, go and look for a job at company X. Um, you know, it's almost like a labor broking type role, which we can't play. What we can do is to make sure that there's efficiency in the market matching the supply and demand of skills. And then if we understand that they are retraining or, or, or upskilling requirements that we can facilitate that. Uh, I hope that answers it, Chairperson. Thank you so much. It does. Um, members, we still have some time left. Are there any other um, follow-ups before um, I thank um, the respective stakeholders for the meeting? Going once, going twice. Okay. Thank you so much to AMSA, to the DTI and to DDAT. We highly appreciate the fact that we were able to have this meeting. Um, as I've mentioned before, our committee has been trying to be quite progressive in the past year by inviting various different stakeholders to our committee meetings, depending on the topic um, and Amsala Metal and the possible closing down in Saldana Bay is of great concern to many stakeholders and to this committee and obviously to the people within the community. And I thank the company, I thank DTI for the assistance and I thank DDAT for the assistance as well, as, fish as well as the local government um, in absentia. Um, thank you so much. You are welcome to leave the virtual committee meeting because the members will be continuing with committee business. You are also welcome to stay as um, anyone from the public is allowed to attend our virtual meetings. Thank you. Thank you, Chairperson. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye, Mr. Thank Yonker. You, Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you very much. Okay. Members, we will now be moving on to the second part of our meeting. This first, we will deal with the draft report 
of the committee's oversight visit to Mitchell's Plain. And then we will deal with the draft report on the oversight visit to Saldana Bay IDZ. And then I will um, deal with resolutions um, as well. But I actually think we can deal with resolutions for today first before we deal with the draft reports, if members are OK with that. OK, I'm going to take chair. that as a OK. So if there are any resolutions, um, I'm going to first ask the procedural officer, Ms. Adams, if there are any specific things that you have noted from us during the meeting. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. OK, so um, there were a few um, requests for information. So the first one was the um, five applications um, for assistance, and you asked for a report on whether those were successful or not. Um, then Mibun Kornlo suggested a letter about the um, integration between the different spheres of government. Um, also a report on um, more information with the repurposing of, high of the high-felt steel plant. Um, then a suggested briefing that AMSA come back to brief us on the cost of maintenance. Oh, and then another list of um, organizations um, that, of the support organizations that DDAT spoke about, the master plan as well, that um, uh, DTIC said they could send once completed. Yeah, I think. And then there was the visit to Highfield as well. OK, thank you, members. Um, are they, let me quickly go through those. The five applications and whether they are successful, are we in agreement to ask from DDAT for the list? And if the applications were not from the, to them, that they please um, let us know the outcomes of the applications to CEDA and or um, other organizations. Is everyone happy with that? Yes, yes no, sure. maybe. Okay. Okay, the next question um, resolution was from Honorable Konlo, later regarding the integration of different spheres of governance, government to the minister nationally. That would be to Minister Patel. Um, Honorable Konlo, do you want to quickly speak to this? Um, just so I can understand what exactly would be in such a letter. Thank you, Chair. For me, I think uh, beyond just Minister Patel, I think if we can communicate a, a letter just of, of uh, observation on the matter that um, unless other members feel otherwise, that there seem to be a lack of integration in the response to the Asalomital situation. There is a provincial response uh, which is uh, being done as it has been reported through the task team. And there is also national who's looking at the high level macro environment. And that macro environment in any way will always have a bearing in the province. So for me, I think it's just to call for a more um, integrated approach by the province together with the, with, the, with the national minister. Also integrating what they say is the master plan process, because I would think that also the province must be part of that process, even now at conception stage, so that it's not a matter of just con being consulted at a later stage when I think the service provider, whoever the person is going to be driving that, you know, has already scoped what would that, that work. So for me, I think it's just to indicate the observation made uh, during the presentation and a request that we would like to see on the matter, you know, more integration and would like, uh, you know, further reporting on how that is being improved. Yeah. Okay, Andrew Kondlo, I would suggest um, instead of a letter, if we could simply ask to the DTI and DDAT for a report, a written report on how they are working in terms of the different spheres of government, how they are integrating their approaches and their responses to this particular matter. I don't know if a letter specifically is necessary, 
Also, I'm not sure if I'm in agreement with all of the points you put forward regarding why we should put the letter specifically, which is why I'm suggesting instead of that, perhaps the first step could be that we actually in a, que uh, a written question in our resolutions ask, can they please provide us with the, the responses and the approach for the intergovernmental um, relations? Um, how do you feel about this? Or if there's any other member who have a comment regarding this? Arman Kondla, are you there? Arman Kondla, are you still with us? Chair, I support He's your muted. proposal. Oh, sorry, sorry, my mic was muted. Okay. I wanted to say, I wanted to okay. get the other views since you've already indicated your views, Chair. So that's because it is not my point. It's all obviously a yes. resolution of the committee. Yes, okay. So, Honorable of Vesta, sorry, you were also speaking. Uh, no, Chair, I wanted to support your proposals in this regard. Okay. Um, are those the only comments regarding this? Okay. Honorable Mkondlo, um, are you happy with that proposal? Chair, Honorable I think at this point, yeah, I'm saying, Chair, at this point, I think the approaches are not the same. So um, um, I think the vote at this point, obviously, is, is not going to be on my side. So um, I'm, I'm okay because I would think that both in their presentation, they did exactly that. They presented what they are doing and the others will have presented what they are doing. Maybe there's something new that they give, can give us in those reports, but I'm, I'm, I'm fine if that is the majority view. Thanks, Chair. Okay. Saida, I saw your, Ms. Adams, I saw your little purple circle light up. Did you want to just indicate anything? And, uh, sorry, Chair, I don't know why it lit up. <laughs> no problem. Okay, let me quickly go to the other resolutions. Um, info regarding repurposing of Highfeld as well as a visit. Um, are members in agreement with this? Yes, no, maybe. Okay, I'm going to take silence as a yes, yes then yes, if there sure. are no objections. Okay, um, I think that we can maybe... No problem. I think as a footnote for the Highfeld visit, we can just maybe indicate that we are perhaps even happy with doing this once DTI um, has assessed the safety and lockdown, um, because we also don't want to um, break any lockdown regulations. Um, and the cost of maintenance, I do think that the maintenance cost to resolution will probably go into some of the confidential information. So my suggestion would be that we ask for that in a written form and if there's any confidential information that at, at the AMSA indicates such on such a written submission, um, is members are members okay with that? Agreed. Yes, no, maybe. Okay. Then the organizations list um, the support to DDAT. Um, I think they indicated that they've already sent it to us. So I don't think I need that as a resolution again, but if members want, we can have it noted down. Andrew Kondlo, I see your purple purple circle. Yes, yes, Chair. I think on, okay. the, on the, yes, I, I, I have read, I think the report that DDAT uh, uh, shared and that report is exactly what they presented today. It's more about the number of workshops, the number of people that attended the workshops. I think what, what I'm interested in specifically, I mean, is the fact that I think Hammond did mention that there were about, I think, 20 subcontractors which they've assisted, one or two have said this. So I would have wanted out of the 20, what is the situation now? I think for me, that would be the, uh, the more, you know, um, more uh, specified data that one is looking over and above what they have given in terms of the jobs uh, with the, the the people that they've indicated even mentioned now it is not i didn't see it in the report that there are people who get employed in the in the northern cape is that a data available if it is can it be provided if not it's still okay because it's more generalized even in the in the report they submitted 
Okay. Um, Ms. Adams, did you get that? Is it possible for us to use your fancy English for us as a resolution there? <laughs> um, I got that, yeah. Okay, perfect. And then the final one was the master plan. I think myself and Andre Munkonlo asked for that. But I also like to add to that that once the master plan by DTI has been completed and they send that to us, if they could also just send um, the SARS payment uh, pricing system as well to us and that they mentioned in their report, if that is available. Um, are there any other resolutions, members? Chair, on the, on the master plan, can I just add that uh, maybe can we get, I'm not sure if members do have or I missed it in the documentation, the West Coast um, industrial plan that I think uh, Bridget was uh, referring to, if we can get copy of that and maybe in, sorry, and maybe in your letter you were referring to, to the national and province about intergovernmental relations, if maybe also as part of that, can they explain what is the relationship between the master plan and that West Coast industrial plan? Thanks, Chair. Okay. Uh, Ms. Adams, were you able to get that? Yes, Chair. Okay, thank you. Any other resolutions regarding this specifically? Going once, going twice. Okay, members, we're going to move on to the next uh, matter. Thank you for that, which will be the draft report of the committee's oversight visit to Mitchell's Plain. I do want to comment, it wasn't as much as an oversight visit because we were invited, but I think for the purposes of a report, it's being called that. Um, can we just quickly put that up? Okay, let's see. Yes, it was more of an engagement rather than an oversight visit, given that it was an invitation. But let's start with page one. Okay, go down. Members, if you can just check. Okay, page one. Any edits? Okay, page two. Any edits? Okay, page three. Any edits? Okay, page four. Okay, any edits? I think it's nice that we've included the respective um, stories from people specifically. It's page five. Is there any other um, resolutions that members would like to include there? Going once. Uh, Chair. Honorable Yes, thank you. I see in the in the section on resolutions, um, uh, what is captured there is that the committee agreed to make resolutions or recommendations at the adoption stage of the report. So it means, um, I'm assuming that what it means is that we must then make resolutions about the issues that are, that are here today. Is that what it means? Yes, hence I'm asking if there's anything else that members would like to include. Um, I would probably suggest that we send the particular concerns to businesses, to the respective department for investigation and to report back to um, back to us on this particular matter. Um, but is there anything specific you would like to add? Yes, Chair. Yes, I, I, I support the, your proposal to send the individual issues to the departments uh, and then we get report of progress. The, 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 the two uh, proposals in additions I have, Chair. One, I think uh, I would like for us to get an indication from uh, DDET of what uh, kind of, um, you know, interface or even an engagement platform, if there is, with uh, chambers of this nature of business or business forums in these different communities. Is there such a, a, a framework or a, a, a platform 
um, one would be interested uh, to, to know because as you had said that we got invited at this point and there are a number of issues that um, I think were raised by this particular chamber, you know, on matters that they would like government to respond to. So for me, I'm asking, is there an existing um, a, a platform through which did it or even through the municipality they are able to give space to such formations to make input uh, through either the LED or the provincial economic strategy. So that's the first one. The, the, the second one, in the conversation, I think there was a lot in the, the because there's a plan, uh, that's a vision that um, uh, the chamber presented to us about what they view should be their vision going forward. And uh, they indicated that that particular vision has been lobbied with various government departments uh, to date. And I'm not sure whether our provincial department that is did that, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> is one of those. If we can understand if there has been any engagement on the vision that uh, the chamber is prepared, and if so, is there any response by the department to what is being put in, in, in on the table by the by the chamber to include? I think the whole issue of tourism because I think their plan, amongst others, was more tourism related on things that they would want to see happening given, you know, the spatial and geographic location of that particular area. So that's why I'm asking if indeed they were engaged, you know, in looking at the plan itself, um, is there any response or issues that they would share with us as the committee in responding to such? Thank you very much. Okay. Let's quickly thank you, Honorable Kondlo. Ooh, that cough, Honorable Kondlo, I hope you're okay. <laughs> um, let's quickly use our, our nice English here regarding the first bullet point. How about we write um, requesting the information and or progress on the um, basically we forward the particular concerns in the report to the respective department and request information and or progress on the particular matters, if any. You can also use your own fancy English there for us because I just want us to finish this before we actually adopt. Okay, the next one from Honorable Kondlo. Um, she mentioned the word framework. I don't see the word framework there, so let's ask for um, fr a framework um, for engaging or an engagement platform. You can also use your own fancy English there. or engaging chambers or business forums within the the Western Cape. And if any, if such information could be provided for us. But you can also use your own fancy English there, Ms. Glitter. Um, perhaps we can say framework for engaging platforms. No. Um, let's see there. Okay. okay. Is it okay if Ms. Kluter uses her nice Good. English? Can't <laughs> complete that <laughs> later. Good day, Chairperson. Chairperson? Yes. It's Lizette. Yes. Good day, members. Um, I think what I'll do is I'm just basically making sort of crip notes, but um, Zaid and I will refine it. Um, once we basically sit with a document. I basically just want to make notes. No problem. Okay, and the final one, perhaps we can frame it in um, whether the chamber has, has sent or provided the department with the information regarding its vision um, and and what the department's role in it maybe is, um, or how the department is able to assist, or the viability of such a vision. I'm not sure which, which particular fancy English you would like to use there. And um, Honorable Nkondlo wanted the vision of tourism related matters to be included. So we can maybe say, um, and with particular reference also to the tourism aspects of the vision, but you guys can can use the correct wording then. 
Any other resolutions, members? Okay, members, if there are no other resolutions, is can I ask um, if we are okay with adopting the report with the amendments subject to um, Ms. Kluter and Ms. Adams just um, refining the English and grammar on the three specific resolutions? Agreed to, Chair. Agreed. Thank you, Honorable Mitchell and Honorable Van der Westhuizen, Ms. Kluter and Ms. Adams. Um, thank you for that. And then we move on to our next one, which is the draft report on the oversight visit to Saldana by IDZ. We are also going to be discussing resolutions in this one. So if we could just have that up quickly. OK, page one members. OK, you can go down. Any edits? Page two. If we can just quickly go back up on page two. I just want to check is free port one word or is there a hyphen between free and port? Because I don't know. I just I, I want to check there in the first paragraph. Uh, last sentence. Reports. I'm not sure if if the hyphen between free and port or if it is one word. OK, if we can just have that checked. Um, any other edits on page two? If none, we can then go to page three. Sorry, if we can just go down. OK, page three. OK, you can go down. Page four. Can go down. Page five. Page six. Page seven. OK, let's just stop there at the resolutions. Members, are there any specific resolutions that you would like to include? Going once. Going twice. Um, OK, I try to Flick my my mic. I don't have the raise the hand function on this phone. Sorry, Chair. No problem. Andrew Bonko, yes. you can see it. Yes, I wanted to say on on the observations under 4.6, where there is currently no the no it says there is no there is a lack of regulatory process in South Africa for oil and gas. I wanted to check if it is possible for us. Um, I think to write to to DMR. Um, in terms of this, just to get a, a clarity about this gap in the regulatory process, um, because uh, I would think um, as a concern raised and how it, uh, it creates, you know, the long waiting times, as mentioned, in terms of uh, uh, the, the processes at, at, at the port. Can we, can we take a, a position to write to DMR and just get a clarity either DMI, DMR or a DTI. I'm not sure which is the relevant department in this in this in this regard. The second one, Chair, for me is that um, um, I think the one issue um, is always uh, I think uh, the support or the funding to the development or the development unit that is led uh, by Mr. Lakaban. That I think we need to. Or continue to place this on the radar screen of the of the committee, and just find out um, whether there is any progress uh, to date in terms of a funding model uh, as it relates to the the, the funding of uh, that particular uh, function 
of the Department of Skills and all the other things, both from um, uh, DDET but also from DTI, where the policy of in the the S the I what do you call this the SEZ policy is located in in DTI. So for me, I think I'm interested to understand why then is uh, the, the the transformation function not directly funded. Thanks. Sorry, Chair, I oh, think... Uh, sorry, you I just realised I'm muted, sorry. Oh, yeah, I was... <laughs> um, I'm trying to lip-read, but... Uh... Uh, apologies for that. Okay, can we quickly go up to 4.6? Um, because I want to actually suggest that we take Andre Mongkondlo's resolution one step further, and instead of simply writing to the Department of Mineral Resources and DTI, perhaps we can ask them for a briefing on the matter and ask for DTI and DDAT to join in that briefing on the regulatory processes in South Africa for the oil and gas industry. I'm assuming because it's probably a national competency that DDAT will probably be invited for observation and stakeholder um, reasons. But I do think maybe that both DMR, DTI and DDAT, that we should hear the, the um, uh, comments on the particular matter. Arbon Kodo, would you be happy with that? That we do a briefing on it? I'm okay, because, I'm okay, Chair. Okay, um, I would then like to suggest that we include on that day that we do the briefing, if they're gonna be briefing us on the regulatory processes of this particular industry, that they also then perhaps brief us on, um, that we ask the Minister of DMR to brief us then on the recent draft regulations for energy and IPPs that, that he released. Um, because if I remember correctly, that regulations of that nature doesn't come to provinces for approval of any sort, but I do think that it does have an impact on provinces um, specifically. And if we're going to have such a briefing, it might be useful for us to also just hear what specifically will be the, the factors that will be taken into account in the energy industry as well. Uh, members, any comments regarding that? If members are happy, yes, no, maybe? Support, yes. Okay. Um, and then let's quickly go to the second resolution. Okay, um, Ms. Kuta, are you going to just write that in your fancy English thing for us regarding the, the progress regarding the funding model for skills and that particular unit, as well as the transformation function? how uh, that is captured within that within that model. But yourself and Ms. Adams can use your fancy English when you when you when you deal with the particular drafting of the finalization of the document. Are there any other resolution oh, numbers? Going once, going twice. Sure. Okay. Yes, on 4.9, uh, the, 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 the issue of CIDB, uh, members would, would, would uh, remember that um, the ITZ did mention the experiment that they did to try and, and um, integrate or um, increase participation of local contractors, you know, against the CIDB with its challenges. But I think somewhere, whether this matter, Chair, we share with the chair of uh, transport and public works who's also our member you know i would i would i would really want us to consider you know a briefing uh, from CIDB you know in terms of what are some of these uh, uh, impediments you know uh, to enable 
uh, especially emerging contractors to participate in some of these much more complex uh, projects because we will be sitting with expectations of entities like the Saldana IDZ, you know, and then they are disabled by the same, you know, regulations that we have of uh, the, the industry. So I wanted to say we can either ask it to be done through the transport and public works or it comes to us. I'm not sure what would be the best uh, uh, way. I will leave that to your wisdom. Thanks. Okay, Honorable Mkondlo, can we then maybe put as a resolution that we um, we are briefed on this particular matter, construction industry development, but that we perhaps ask the Chair of Transport and Public Works whether it can be a joint briefing. And I think perhaps that one plus our previous um, request can then be asked to the Chair of Transport and Public Works um, as well. Then if we have this briefing, I would like to add that previously we heard about the application processes. Apologies, Honorable Kond, I'm just going to mute you quickly for the background noise. Um, if we can just maybe add then that we ask Transport and Public Works for um, to add the information or briefing regarding the application process for construction and tenders. We've heard a lot about this, especially in SCOPA and the budget season in committees and so on. And it seems like the application processes for tenders and so on is very complicated. And I would argue very um, archaic almost in certain documentation and certain stamps and certain faxing and all that jazz that has to be to be done in order to get an application through. Are members okay with this to be added? Members? Yes, no, maybe? I support. I support. Okay. Yep. And then just as a final resolution, I would like the respective, uh, it's quite a number of documents that the Zaldana by IDZ referred to in their research and studies, for example. And I think it would be useful for the committee to have such research and studies and other documents that they refer to. Would it be possible for us a resolution for us just to ask for these documents and for the procedural officer just to um, list them in the documentation, in the resolution um, for us then? Yes, no, maybe. Yes, Chair, I can listen. Agreed. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Any other resolutions, members? Going None once. From my side. Going twice. Chairperson, okay. Chairperson, yes, can you Kondo? maybe can you can you advise uh, or what what then is the situation now? You know, uh, I know you normally. This is one uh, area that you always raise the issue of the LNG. Uh, infrastructure. Remember, Transnet briefed us, and I can see in the resolutions um, that um, there were legislative concerns uh, that that also were raised. Perhaps it's something um, I'm, I'm not sure whether it's part of the programming because this was one area that I think in the program of the committee, you know, it's a matter that was also high up in terms of our interest of what would be happening with LNG in the province. I understand that we've got COVID now, but I'm just saying I'm. I'm interested what is it that's going to happen in terms of resolving those issues, especially your legislative issues, but also going forward uh, in terms of us, uh, you know, getting updates, whether it's quarterly or somewhere uh, towards the end of the year. Okay. I think as a response to Amrom Kondlo that that is more or less captured in our request for a briefing from DMR in the oil and gas industry, as well as um, regulation and for information the draft regulations on energy that has been recently released. But what we can perhaps even add that they perhaps we should then ask Transnet to also then come back to us regarding their concerns on regulation, because it will then impact them and the province. And if we go further, we could even um, include ESCOM to ask them if they can also then be part of that meeting because those, um, those would be the respective entities that will also be affected um, irrespective of the provincial impact. Andrew Bonkondo, would you be happy with that? That we include okay trans and that. ESCOM in that briefing? Okay, Thank perfect. You, Any other resolutions, members? 
if none, may I have a um, proposal uh, for the report with the amendments and subject to our resolutions being put into fancy English? Chair, I would uh, propose that we adopt the report as amended. Thank you, Honorable van der Westhuizen. Is there a seconder? I know we don't need a seconder, but I would prefer a seconder. I second, Chairperson. Thank you, Andre Pongkondo. That is then adopted. Members, thank you so much for this meeting. I think it's been very productive. I think it's been um, very enlightening. And um, thank you for staying on the line on the line for such a long time. I know data is quite expensive. Members, until our next meeting, thank you. It is adjourned.